Okay, it's 8.30, so let's start. So we are very happy to hold this tutorial about object localization for free, going beyond, beyond self-supervised uh, feature and learning. Um, so in this tutorial, we have four uh, different parts. The first one is the introduction uh, of Patrick Perez, um, who, which is entitled Setting the Stage, Visual Objects in Scene Understanding. Then uh, I will introduce you to how to exploit self-supervised features to perform object localization. We'll have a 20 minutes break uh, that coincides, I think, with the coffee break. Uh, so there will be opportunities to get coffee then. Um, then we'll continue with the talk of Thomas uh, Kiff about self-supervised learning integrating object aware um, priors, uh, object aware priors, sorry. And uh, the last talk um, will be by uh, Wendy Shi uh, to uh, talk about, he will talk about us about discovering objects with multimodal signals. So we hope you will enjoy the flow of this tutorial. Uh, we try to have uh, a story um, and we'll have closing remarks um, at 12. Um, so yes, that's for the conclusion. So let's start with uh, Patrick. Okay, so um, Patrick Perez is a Valio VP of AI um, and scientific director of Valio AI. Um, Valio AI is an AI research lab focused on Valio automotive application, uh, self-driving cars in particular. Uh, before joining Valio, Patrick uh, was a researcher at Technicolor, NVIDIA and uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge. And his research uh, in interests are mainly focused on multimodal scene understanding and computational imaging. So let's start. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Ryan. I hope you're hearing me well in the room, that's for sure, but online to be seen. Um, I'm very happy to be here. So the, my mission this morning, apart from uh, waking you up a bit uh, with my uh, Father Day t-shirt, is uh, to uh, give a bit of context uh, for, this, um, for this tutorial. And in particular, I figured that I could try, let's see if it works here, it should work. I, will, I, I should try and elicit a few of the words which are in the title of this, uh, of this, um, of this tutorial. And uh, maybe a bit to my surprise, it, it, it turned out not to be so easy. So in particular, the words object, localization and self-supervised learning. Uh, I'll try to give some context, uh, context about all of these and for free and be, be, going beyond, I will probably leave that to the, to the uh, few other speakers. Um, so let's go and let's see how, it, how we can uh, exp explain a bit or um, shed some light on these terms. So what about objects? Um, it sounds uh, obvious, but uh, when you try to dive, it's another story. So being a literary person myself, I turn first to a dictionary. So I went to the online Oxford dictionary and I ask what is an object? And uh, so the, the beginning of the definition is here on the screen. And it says essentially that it's a thing that can be touched or seen and which is alive, which uh, came a bit as a surprise to me. It is uh, from a computer vision perspective, uh, which is not live, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so I wasn't completely satisfied. I, I found it a bit restrictive. Uh, so I turned to my uh, other favorite dic dictionary, which is the Larousse, it's the French dictionary. And I found that the beginning of the definition was a bit more inclusive in a sense. So now it's again about being uh, uh, perceptible by sight and touch, but it's not restrict restricted to not alive things. So otherwise everything in the, in, the, in the room, including carpet, but not you guys and myself uh, are, are, are things, are objects, sorry. So now it's, we are getting closer to wh what we are aim aiming at. And also the second one, which I found interesting, the second definition is it's a solid thing uh, made by human to serve a purpose, like a tool. So I found that interesting in the prospect of, uh, of computer vision. But being a geek as well and, uh, and uh, going along with my, uh, my uh, time, I ask uh, a modern chatbot what is uh, um, an object. So after a few iterations and a bit of editing, this is the uh, first part of the answer that I got. Uh, so in the physical world, an object is something which is, it's an entity, uh, which is distinct, which has a, a, a place in, in space and has some properties and can be perceived by senses. So not only sight or touch, which I found interesting. 
And then I went a bit beyond and asked, what is, what is it for a computer vision person? So for all of us in, in Vancouver here, and uh, it, it, I found it quite interesting that it says that it's, a, it's an entity or region of interest in an image or video frame, which can be recognized, we, we'll see. Um, and it can be an object uh, all or a part of an object like a face or hand for a human body. I think we are better equipped here now. Uh, so I'll move to what is a visual object because we are talking about computer vision really here. And I will propose that uh, an object can be seen essentially as a fragment or region of an image, uh, which stems from an entity. We, we can call that as well a thing as opposed to a stuff, to stuff, which has been also a distinction made in some papers. Uh, I, I can, I'll come back to, to that later. And, uh, and this entity, and then we can take different angles to, to this entity. The first one is a bit conceptual or semantic. Uh, in that case, uh, this entity, this visual entity depicts some, an instance of a non-class of object, a non-category, uh, not necessarily existing. So it could be a dog or a dragon uh, or something geometric uh, uh, or a very specific type of dog, etc. cetera. Uh, we can also take another angle, which is physical. In that case, we are back to the uh, definition of the uh, that uh, uh, I was presenting in the first in the previous slide. So it's, it stems from something which is uh, 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 an identifiable structure in the in the space. It's tangible. Uh, it can be live or not. Uh, it could be like a stone, something which is made by humans. Or it can be defined by the fact that you can use it like a, something you can sit on, uh, and it's called affordance. Um, you can also think in terms of perception. <clears throat> uh, in that case, the, the region of interest is, is so-called salient because it, it, for different reasons, maybe because it stands out in the scene or it's something that reoccurs across different images or different video frames uh, or is, is in front as opposed to the background or it's unexpected or it, it ties with, uh, with emotions or memories or, or something which is, uh, which is close to, uh, to our art. Uh, and last but not least, being an engineer as well, you can have a very pragmatic task-centric definition. So it's essentially a region in the image that you need to find in order to serve a, a downstream task. And this can be uh, uh, dexterous manipulation, it can be autonomous navigation, could be editing a content, or it could be visual search uh, on a search engine. So we have many defi definitions here. Uh, so le 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 let's have a little detour here. So, uh, so for instance, to, to just to, see, to, to say that, again, uh, that this is not a very clear cut definition we have here. So if I show you that, uh, okay, it's a pipe. Uh, at least it's the depiction of a pipe, although you might be alerted by the little sentence if you read French, which says, this is not a pipe. And if you have a bit of art context or even visual context, uh, like a, a full a picture, then you realize that the pipe is effectively a painting in a museum, uh, which turns out to be a quite famous uh, painting. Uh, um, uh, but this might sound a bit mundane or anecdotal in the, the for, for, for right now. But if you think in terms of autonomous driving, for instance, and if you have trained a perception system to detect cars or, or other things. Uh, these are real examples of funny uh, or interesting commercials on the side of a bus, but a bit dangerous maybe. And the other one, which is a, a, an optical illusion of a 3D, of a 3D uh, uh, zebra crossing, which is, by the way, extremely effective for the human driver to be, to be aware. But uh, I don't know how it's, what happens with the, with the robot taxis here. Uh, so, yeah, you know. Uh, we have, uh, we have something to be uh, careful about with the definition. So let, let, let's go <clears throat> forward and, uh, um, and let's see how uh, visual objects, how I would call that vi visual object or video object in a video can be now uh, really practically defined uh, for the purpose of the uh, computer vision tasks. So you can start by saying that it's somewhere in the image. So it has a location, it has an extent, and this can be defined by just a center point, could be defined by a, a, an axis aligned bounding box, or the shape of the, uh, of the object, either by uh, pic uh, labeling the pixels or defining the contour of the object in some way. Uh, it, can be, it can come with different parts or key points, uh, which are arranged especially, especially so there is a layout, uh, there is a route which says where is, which connects to the uh, global localization in the image, etc. Uh, this uh, 
region can exhibit or this object, let's call it object again, visual object can uh, exhibit some attributes or properties. Some of, the, of those can be transient, like they are temporary, uh, like moving or the expression of a face can be temporary, uh, or it can be um, something more permanent, like the identity of the object, uh, or whether it, it can be used to sit, uh, or it has certain uh, colors, at least it can be permanent for or, or, or persistent long enough in a video, as opposed to very transient thing. Another aspect, which is more multimodal, this object can emit sounds. So we'll come back to that at the end and also in, in, in other parts of the tutorial. And last but not least, it can be really it can relate to actual semantic categories or subcategories. It can go can be coarse category like a dog or something very specific, like a, a very uh, like husky, very a specific breed of dog, etc. And what we will focus mostly uh, on today is what is called localization. So I get to the second term I wanted to, to elicit in the title, uh, which is uh, um, uh, localization at large with different meanings as, as it were. Okay, um, a few examples to uh, illustrate what I was saying. So in this in this urban scene, so you might be uh, after uh, detecting pedestrians. So in this case, it's axis aligned bonding boxes around the pedestrians. And then in particular, if you want to track them, you want to, to give them IDs. Uh, so here comes different colors for, for the different pedestrians. But if you are more into uh, analysis of each of them, uh, you might go after uh, different attributes. In this work, um, um, we, 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 in collaboration with the PFL, we, we, uh, we looked at a large number of attributes, including the, the age, the, 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 the garment, the intention of the pedestrian to, to cross, for instance, or the attention of the awareness of, of the car, which are obviously very important to look at for uh, safety reason. Uh, a similar thing on the video now, um, where um, we have these um, important attributes of, of intention to cross or, or holding a mobile phone, but also you see the pose in 2D, which are the, uh, the, the, the joints, which by the way, in terms of object, a joint is not a, a, a visible object when you think about it, especially if you ask the annotator to do the annotation, the joint is inside the body, and then most of the time the body is covered by cloth, so effectively it's not visible in the image. Uh, so again, to, to, to make the point that objects, even visual objects are not always uh, that, that easy to define. Uh, another, another example from a, 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 an old project of mine uh, back at Technicolor, where we wanted to annotate all the faces in one Woody Allen movie uh, and ha Hannah and her sisters. Uh, and what you see is the, the head. And I remember, remember trying to, to specify the task for the annotators. So uh, is it just, is it a bounding box? What do we do with things which are occluded, et cetera, et cetera. On top of that, also on this example, we annotated not only the, that there is a face, but who is the character, who is the actor, and uh, if the person is talking or not. That was quite fun, actually. And it's a very good movie. Uh, okay. So objects. Uh, visual objects, objects very important to understand scenes, and they, uh, not surprisingly, uh, come uh, along uh, 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 at the center of uh, a large number of tasks. And I will try to give sort of an overview of these tasks. And this is not going to be exhaustive, but I hope it helps mapping a bit the, 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 the different um, uh, categories of tasks. Um, so the, the, the first class of tasks that I would like to highlight, and actually there are uh, at the heart of the um, of the um, of the of the tutorial is when you are interested in arbitrary objects. Okay, so they can be essentially anything. Uh, um, and uh, the the the, uh, the core of the of the of of, of looking at this, uh, the core of the tasks is about matching different views or different uh, uh, different yeah, different views of this arbitrary object across. Um, uh, across images, etc., and this, this, uh, so either different views of the same object or different instances of the same category of object. Even if you don't know what is this category, it's, it can be unnamed. Okay, uh, and 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 you can do that. Uh, we used to do that with very low-level features, colors, etc., all the way now to deep features, um, and this can suffice. You can do that online, uh, even in a, in a video, or you can do that offline in a collection of of of, of, of images, and it's called trans transactive setting. And, and so essentially what I'm saying is that there is not much semantic here, but they could be a bit beforehand because you are using uh, features which have been learned uh, in a supervised fashion, or you, as we will see, you can use a, a trained proposal, object proposal, which have been trained on actual objects. And now 
coming to the actual tasks themselves, or at least the ones which are quite, quite uh, um, sort of uh, popular or at least uh, recognized. First one is the unsupervised object dis discovery at the category le level. Um, you can also try and, 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 and try uh, and discover objects in, in single images, and we will see uh, much of that later. You can try and retrieve an object from different views. Uh, you can try and recognize that this object in this camera, uh, it turns out to be the same reappearing in another camera. If you are in a, say, uh, in a surveillance setting, it's called uh, re-identification. Um, related to that, you might want to follow an object across the frames of a video of, or of multiple videos. It's a uh, visual, visual object tracking uh, with typically with bounding boxes, not necessarily, but typically, or you can uh, try to delineate a, uh, precisely this object through time and it's called video object segmentation. Okay. Uh, but you might also be really interested in a specific catalog of or taxonomy of, of, uh, of objects. Um, so in that case, obviously you have, you need semantic supervision uh, if you do that with machine learning. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the three typical uh, tasks are object detection, meaning implicitly at the category level, instance segmentation. So segmenting a specific instance of, or instance of specific uh, categories and multi-object tracking where you want to track through times instances from your catalog of, of classes. And I will show examples in a minute. And uh, of course, things are moving fast in the community and now you have all the, uh, what you can do with uh, free form uh, or, or text-based um, uh, text analysis where you, you, and it goes be, beyond objects here, it's really about scene understanding at large, but with objects being important there, uh, trying to understand in an open, in an open way uh, scenes um, uh, using pre-trained visual language models and the, there is, here are a few tasks which are uh, sort of prototypical, uh, doing zero shot detection of objects or segmentation, um, uh, captioning specific part of, the, of, of an image, uh, visual grounding, uh, which is to localize uh, uh, text uh, uh, or referring expression segmentation, which is the similar task where given a descriptive uh, text, you want to segment the part of the image which corresponds to this description. description. And uh, going forward, you might want to answer uh, visual questions about your visual scenes, et cetera, et cetera. So as I said, uh, or maybe one way to simplify this, this uh, map here is to say that uh, the first one block I mentioned, there is, this, there is no such as, as a vocabulary. In the one on the, on the top right, it's a closed vocabulary or closed set. And now we are opening up uh, uh, in, the third part, in the, this third block with uh, open world or open vocabulary. Uh, there are different terminology at the moment. Okay. <clears throat> So I say a few words about, uh, because it won't be discussed much uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the rest of the tutorial about uh, uh, going after uh, objects for, for, from non-class. So as again, there is, you need supervision here because it's semantic, uh, but the supervision can, can come in different forms. It can be full supervision where you have, if it's for detection, where you have the actual look, localization of the, uh, uh, as ground truth of the object. So you might have only image uh, level um, label, so you don't know where it is, so it's weak supervision. Uh, and you, if you train uh, uh, um, an object-centric task with non-categories, it might be because it's your actual task of interest, or you might do that in order to pre-train a representation that you will, you will use later for other tasks or other classes in the case of zero-shot or few-shot learning. Uh, and so, uh, so again, the three uh, key tasks here are detection, segmentation, and tracking. So detection and tracking, in a sense, they are, uh, sorry, detection and segmentation, they are very close in one, very much related. In one case, you are typically after a box and segmentation, so, uh, uh, you are after a precise delineation of the object. The, the, the classic uh, data sets are uh, Pascal uh, visual object uh, categories, <coughs> Pascal VOC, or uh, Microsoft COCO, which stands for common object in context. And you have the classic metrics around the average pre precision or uh, around the um, uh, intersection over union IOU. Uh, and here are uh, some popular and, and uh, tools like RCNN for detection and mask RCNN for the segmentation part and for detection, either a single stage uh, detection SSD uh, and, um, and, and, and YOLO. And, uh, and then the, 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 the start with the transformer with DITER uh, in the 
2022, I think, or 21. And you have um, uh, lots of very good resources online, in particular, the, the, the library Detectron uh, of Meta, or this um, open uh, MMLab uh, resource where you have specific libraries, one for detection, one set for segmentation. And likewise for tracking, it's been a very uh, long-standing task. So you have a long history of uh, of, uh, um, of test beds, in particular the multi-object tracking mode uh, uh, challenges in 15, etc., all the way to 20. Um, for the metrics, it's a bit more. It's a bit trickier, so you have all the detection-based metrics, but then you want also to reason at the at the track uh, level. So you have specific track. Uh, well, you have track-specific metrics, including the one uh, which is about identity identity switch. You might be a. You have, I mean, it's quite common when you have crowded scene of of some same category object that you you exchange identity, and this is not good. So you have to to put that in the metrics, etc. So again, a few. Uh, it, it's very partial, and, and of course, a few recent um, good trackers that I put on the slide, including some with uh, with uh, transformers. And again, in the Open MM Lab uh, uh, library, you have a, a library for tracking. Okay, so this is uh, for people playing with detections. They know this, but this is just to illustrate um, uh, Pascal Vogue. And here you see that you have all the boxes, and they are really uh, bounding boxes in the sense that the all object is included in the in the box. And you have additional things like saying what is the uh, orientation. Uh, well, in a, in a crude way, also whether the object is partially occluded. So you have additional attributes associated to this box in, in addition to the location. And the um, and the class, and if you go to uh, to instant segmentation, this is the MS Coco example, and actually there is a nice tool to to um, to explore this data set. So you can specify, since, for instance, that you want. To, so in this case, there are eighty classes. Pascal Rock is, I think, uh, twenty. Uh, you can specify that you want a scene with pedestrian, cyclist, well, all the road users you might imagine, and also and also signs. And actually, I found these two scenes in the in the data set with the segmentation, and you see that uh, uh, it's fairly detailed, and probably it has been a nightmare for the for the annotators. And you can even uh, do that in videos. And yesterday, it was mentioned uh, in a workshop. The, uh, for instance, in the um, in the way more open data set, there is a semantic segmentation, uh, instant segmentation video. Sorry, video instant segmentation. Challenge and this is um, one example of the uh, of the ground truth. Uh, and effectively, each pedestrian is individually uh, labeled. I, I don't think it's very visible on the on my animated GIF. Sorry. Okay. Uh, just a, a word on. Uh, of course, I'm not going to dive into the gra these graphics, but just to say that first of all, that if you don't know yet papers with with code. It's, it's a fantastic resource uh, uh, when it comes to benchmarks, uh, uh, state of the arts, performance, et cetera. And this is to show you within uh, uh, seven years since fast RCNN, the progress uh, in uh, object detection on, um, on, um, on Coco here. Uh, there is still some room, but uh, it goes fast. And the same for semantic segmentation on Coco as well uh, since uh, 16. Uh, so maybe after this, uh, this uh, CVPR, you might try and fight for these uh, uh, for these competitions. All right, uh, tracking, multi-object tracking. So these are two examples: one old, one uh, recent. The recent one is shows a, a very crowded scene where you have a, 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 a multi-object tracker for people. So it's really about detecting and tracking people. So in that case, it's it's a mix of detecting things, objects, and 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 matching them across time. So it's about uh, um, alignment. Uh, and this is done with a transformer in this case. And what you see at the bottom, uh, I like this uh, old example of um, tracking um, uh, mice. Uh, so again, it's a non-category. So there is a prior on the shape of the mice uh, of, of a mouse. So there is a parametric shape model which is used, and you see here how it's, how it's, it's tracked. And at that time, it was done, I think, with a particular filter of some sort. Um, all right. Okay. Now I'd like to switch and we're getting closer to the, 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 the core of the tutorial about arbitrary objects. So um, you, uh, one task is given a, a single scene, a single image to, 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 to find and even segment things which are interesting for one reason or another. And actually it's, again, it's like uh, all the, 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 the tasks I, I just illustrated before. It's not a very um, um, recent problem. And I like this example of, of grab cut, um, which is about foreground uh, uh, 
subtraction uh, using uh, uh, simple uh, uh, color, color modeling. By the way, for the people who have uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, on, uh, I think it's at least on Windows, you still have uh, in PowerPoint this remove background, background uh, feature uh, for, for images, which is super, I used it for this presentation. Uh, on, on PowerPoint, um, and it's based on this on this work from uh, from uh, Rother et al. Uh, into uh, 2004. And uh, but now we do that in a more powerful way, and uh, Oriane uh, will uh, will talk about it using uh, pre-trained uh, um, pre-trained self-supervised features, essentially to you know to to find uh, uh, salient objects in in a single scene. But you might want to do also to find arbitrary objects across images. Uh, so uh, in a sense, you can you either you match one view to a collection. It's one to end matching. Uh, I'm going to to show an example, um, and it's uh, typically uh, well, I'll show examples. And also you might want to do that collectively in a collection. So it's essentially end, end to end matching, and it's grouping or clustering. You call it the the the, the way you, you you prefer. And I show an example. Uh, okay, so. Another old paper I love, which is by Sivich and, and Sisserman, Video Google. So it's, and there was a demo online. I don't, I don't know if it's still online. So you can uh, take one frame for, for, from a movie. In this case, it's a Groundhog Hog Day. And you, you select by hand the tie of uh, an object. So it does the tie of, uh, of Bill Murray in this case. And then you can retreat all across the, the movie. Turns out that he has the same tie quite a, in a few scenes. Uh, and uh, you, you see that uh, even on the top right, it's 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 a it's a true positive, um, and it's only based on uh, on uh, local features, what we now call uh, engineered features. Um, and uh, you can do even more because uh, the, your selection is a video frame in a movie. You can start by tracking the nearby frames in the same shot. So you, have you then you get multiple views of your query, it's query expansion, and then uh, equipped with these multiple views, you can have a, an even better uh, retrieval in the rest of the movie. And these are examples that are retrieved and some of them are pretty um, uh, difficult. I don't know if uh, people see my, uh, my mouse here, but uh, you see that the van here is at the back uh, in the scene. So it's been retrieved. So very powerful, very neat uh, work. Uh, similar thing with tracking. So here it's about tracking a completely arbitrary object. Uh, on the left, what you see uh, is going to loop now. You will see that the, there is first a selection of the face. So the, 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 the guy who turns out to be the author, Kalal, is essentially saying, track my face. Okay, and then there is a little game with a, a photo collection where, where, where there is his face, but essentially there is no, uh, the, 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 the algorithm is, is really about finding different in views of this very same object, which happens to be the face of this guy. Uh, on the right, we similar similar things just based on color. Uh, and in this case, you see also that it's not necessarily a bounding box, uh, but it could be an ellipse in this case, so you have more degrees of freedom. <laughs> Uh, but there is no prior, there is no uh, semantic knowledge whatsoever here. Uh, uh, and now, if we go to semantic, not semantic, sorry, segmentation of the object. So this is an illustration of a task that is usually called visual object segmentation. Uh, so you select an object uh, in one frame or in several frames, and you want to segment it all over the the, the video uh, sequence. Uh, in the context of video editing, it's called cutout. Uh, sorry, there is a typo, uh, I see now. Uh, but also if you are into the movie industry, uh, it's called rotoscoping. It's something very useful for visual effects. And you see here uh, uh, something from 2015 called Jump Cut, uh, where I think the, 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 they, they have not been reloaded the other sides. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, the, and you see that uh, the, the, the objects can be very complex, very flexible. Uh, there is a ball, there is the guy. Uh, and, and, and again, there is absolutely no semantic prior here involved. It's about local appearance modeling and, and matching things through, through time. Okay, uh, how, how, how am I with time? Five more minutes. Five more minutes, that's good. Um, so one thing which proved um, uh, quite interesting in the uh, in the uh, object uh, the detection um, the community, um, in particular the with, with the faster uh, faster CNN, uh, for instance, is the idea that you can uh, 
Uh, in order to do to detect objects from non categories, you may you might start by trying to detect or to propose regions in order to speed up things to propose potentially interesting regions in your image, which are likely to contain uh, an object. And this is it's, it's called region proposal, object proposal, and they come with a degree of objectness. Uh, and it's something which has, uh, which is very uh, convenient or very useful. And there are different flavors of that. So one, uh, for instance, with selective search uh, in, in 13 or edge boxes in 14, where it's, it's based on extremely low level features, no real uh, um, training here, uh, either for safety search based on super pixels or fragments, which are aggregated at different scales and, 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 uh, and aspect ratio. And uh, you end up with a few hundreds, a few thousand sometimes uh, proposals which can be then processed by your detector which is essentially then a classifier uh, and the same with edge boxes in that case you are uh, looking at the uh, the strength and orientation of the uh, of the edges uh, in some regions of the image uh, but you can have more powerful things in particular as I said with uh, 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 with a faster RCNN where effectively the, the the box proposal thing is part of the network so it's trained actually with a semantic uh, supervision because you you, you rely on the uh, object ground, ground truth here and uh, so it's called RPN for region proposal network okay um, so and you might using this thing you can uh, you can uh, detect uh, you can do what is called uh, unsupervised ob object detection or discovery sorry where uh, given so the, across a collection of images uh, all these region proposals and you characterize them in terms of saliency and also uh, uh, pairwise similarity, you can find, uh, you can build a graph or you can discover a graph with, uh, with uh, some uh, um, either heuristics or more of um, more uh, sound methods. And you see the, the key references here uh, uh, in order to discover, uh, as in this example, that some, uh, some images share uh, common objects at this, in this case, at the category level. Uh, and this is just examples where you see that you can discover planes without knowing what is a plane or you can discover uh, uh, bicycles, et cetera. And at the bottom, you see examples, uh, results in, in, in images compared to the ground truth in the, uh, the ground truth is in yellow. So on the right, you see um, uh, failures. So I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll skip that now and I'm almost there. Um, so what I've just uh, mentioned here is the idea that we, we can start discovering things uh, in this case, in the previous case at the category level, but uh, without any semantic uh, supervision. So no class labels. And so that's good. So which brings us to, uh, to, uh, to the, the, the other talks of the day. Uh, but just to, in terms of terminology, one, one uh, quick point here. So I know they're, they're, it's not always uh, frozen, but uh, uh, effectively, there is some, something which used to be called unsupervised learning, which is about discovering without uh, uh, supervision at all uh, structures like uh, 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 clusters, low dimensional or, uh, uh, or low rank structures in your uh, data collection. And you have all the usual suspects in terms of methods here. And then there is self-supervised learning, which is more about setting up a pretext task. So there is an actual task that you build yourself for which the supervision comes for free from the data and then you supervise the learning of the representation for this task before and then uh, hopefully the representation is useful for uh, other tasks uh, but in a sense at least in, in many cases there is some at the end of the day there is some kind of uh, underground uh, uh, supervision here which already starts with the selection of the of the training data at least when it's not at, at a huge scale you you have a you you select the data for instance it's if image net it's object centric images etc the they are vertically oriented so the gravity goes this way uh, it sounds like uh, uh, mundane again but it's 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 something uh, it's a, it's a cho it's a choice okay um, so self supervised learning uh, there will be more of that uh, to, uh, in the, the other talks so there is a there are classic pretext tasks that you can play with either you try to uh, recover things that, that you have hidden uh, could be the color it could be part of the image could be the next frame in the video uh, etc uh, you, you you might want to recognize a transformation transform that you have applied to the object like rotations uh, with rotnet uh, and you apply the, the the transform and you want the system to recognize this transform. Uh, you might want to group to, to find groups which are meaningful, uh, typically um, uh, deep cluster with deep clustering, uh, or something very powerful is which is to uh, to apply different uh, transforms uh, 
which don't change the uh, semantic of your image, and then you want to find um, uh, representations uh, for which which are invariant to these uh, view changes. Uh, and also, if you have multiple modalities, you might align across the, uh, the, the, the different modalities. Uh, and uh, in particular, this view invariance, oh, sorry, uh, I'm missing something. And depending on what you do, you have different learning techniques, different losses, can be generative, discriminative, contrastive, or uh, uh, using um, uh, uh, distillation, and it's called self teaching uh, in this case. Uh, and just to, and I'm not going to explain that, of course, as well, but to just to, to show the, the variety of variety of things that people have come up with for self-supervised learning with uh, view invariance. Uh, some of them where there is EMA, which is uh, exponential moving average, means that there is a self-teaching going on here. Uh, and uh, see, some of these things are pretty uh, uh, famous, Di uh, Dino in particular, which will uh, come back in the, in the talks. All right, looking forward, and that will be my, the end. Um, so I, I was really focusing on images here in my presentation, but obviously, and we see that at CVPR, computer vision people are not only about uh, after images, they look in, uh, in point cloud, at point clouds, videos, et cetera. So uh, other signals uh, for people of doing um, uh, autonomous driving, like we do at Valley we are very much into bird eye view, which is the top view uh, above the ego car. And of course, in this example from Agroverse, which I, 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 I saw uh, yesterday, uh, you have everything represented. So the top view, the fact that you have two modalities, the LiDAR and the camera, and you are after objects, uh, uh, the non-objects, the cars, but it turns out that for autonomous driving, there is a very long tail and there are very, very rare objects that you, know, uh, you, you might want to accommodate with open vocabulary which brings me to this. Uh, so there are plenty of things going on now, new architectures with the, the, the visual transformers, uh, the slot attention that we will be discussed at length uh, by Thomas. And of course, there are all the promises of these uh, foundation models and, uh, uh, and generative models in particular, uh, but uh, visual language models to do reasoning, to uh, revisit all our few shot and zero shot tasks uh, in a much more powerful way. And uh, to finish uh, uh, with the links to what is going to be uh, to, to, to be presented now, uh, Orian will talk in particular about the use of self-supervised uh, uh, representations. Uh, Thomas, of, uh, not only but also, uh, will talk about slot attention, and Wadi will uh, tell us a bit more about multimodality and also, I think, uh, the use of uh, of visual language models. And with that, I will stop. Uh, thank you very much. For one question. No questions. Okay. Maybe. No question. Maybe I have you have, one, a, you have a question. I have a question. She has uh, a question. You oh, define God. a lot um, the objects and so how how they are. And I was wondering. This is uh, not prepared. <laughs> I was wondering uh, how. How does the uh, definition of the object impact uh, what we do afterwards? Um, and I guess it, it changes to be on the task, uh, et cetera, but do a better definition will help us think, uh, do better algorithms. I think at least if, okay. So at the end of the day, you need, uh, because we are solving tasks, I, I guess, at the end of the day. And uh, even if we do self-supervised, we need uh, uh, ground truth for at least to compute the, the performance. And, uh, and in order to ex explain to the annotator what to do, I think you need to be extra careful. And I think, and it's probably one thing I've seen as an evolution in the computer vision community uh, through the three last decades, it's very much driven by benchmarks now, uh, which is good. It, it really helps pushing the envelope, uh, but the benchmark defines the task. So, which means that the ground truth define whatever you do so you have to be and if you are solving a task which is not uh, it might be good for only um, academic work but uh, then if you want to deploy on the real world systems you'd better make sure that you, the task is really well aligned so meaning the annotation well aligned with your final task uh, and we see that every day uh, uh, when we uh, when we work on uh, uh, driving automation and driving uh, assistance thank you Thanks. 
Um, okay, so I have the honor to introduce myself. Um, so my name is uh, Oriane Smyuni. I will, uh, I'm um, a research scientist at uh, Valeo AI. Um, I've done my PhD at Inria Ren uh, before that. Um, and I will talk to you today about how to exploit um, uh, self-supervised features in order to do unsupervised object localization. So Patrick mentioned that object localization is a key uh, is a key problem for many systems that we have today, either on the object uh, view. So you can define in different ways. You can think of it as object detection. So you want a box where you have your object. You might want to label each pixel, knowing exactly uh, where are the objects, and you might want to define the instance to so to separate each object. But in order to produce good quality models that will do those tasks, you will require a lot of annotation, human made most of the time. And you might also need to define a finite set of classes. And we are seeing it now, a finite set of classes, finite, finite vocabulary is quite uh, restrictive. And with VLMs, with uh, Clip, et cetera, we, are, we want more open world uh, solutions. So in this talk, I will talk to you about how to perform object localizations with no annotation. Um, and in particular, that might help for, for instance, discovering this, those types of objects. And you might also think of Segment Anything, which was uh, produced in um, um, early this year, which has shown the interest uh, for the entire community to segment things, no matter what their class is. We want to find the objects. Um, so, Let's start with this image that I'm sorry you'll see a lot during my talk. Um, so there are different tasks when we consider unsupervised object localization. The first one that has been defined by Patrick earlier today is unsupervised object discovery, where you try to fit one, you try to find one object. You know that every image contains at least one object. So that's it. You want to fit a box to, what, to at least one object in the image. The metric to evaluate this is called Corelock. And it's basically the percentage of correct boxes. So you compare each box to ground truths, to all the ground truths that you have, and you find the one that are correct. And so with that, you have a pretty good idea of, is my one uh, box correct? Another task is unsupervised identity detection, where this time you want to segment a foreground mask. So it's one mask per image. Um, this is evaluated with IOU or accuracy. And here again, you don't do discrimination between objects, you just want one foreground mask per image. So this is single object mask uh, tasks, but the community has been working quite hard on this uh, unsupervised object localization that now methods are tackling multi-object problems, where this time you might want to detect uh, all of the objects in the, in, the in the image, sorry. And so you can do unsupervised class agnostic object detection. And the other uh, side of it is unsupervised class agnostic instance segmentation, where this time you have one mask uh, per object. So we'll see uh, through uh, my talk, the different uh, methods for both of those um, problems. So some background, so Patrick mentioned, uh, before CNNs were very successful, before transformers, obviously, um, they were uh, handcrafted, handcrafted features that have been very useful and are still acti actually actively used right now. Uh, selective search and edge boxes are two methods that allow to use the pixel level information and to produce uh, a lot of boxes. The recall is really high. You know that most likely your object is, is, one, is one of those uh, box, uh, but the precision is low. What is a box that you want to focus on? What is object, what is not? On the other side, uh, you have methods that have uh, tried to think of the object discovery problem as uh, I have a data set. I know in my data set I have recurring patterns, recurring objects, and I want to find them. So the idea there is that you have probably proposals in your image and you might want to match all of your proposals with all of the one data set uh, and try to find the one that are repeating a lot, the popular uh, boxes. So this is very interesting work. Uh, however, it has qu quadratic costs. You need to compare all the boxes to all the boxes of the entire data set. So it's not really scalable. Um, okay, so that's for some background. Now, what happened uh, in the last years is that self-supervision appeared to be very, very successful in doing uh, image representation with no annotation. Um, you might think of RotNet, which I guess is easy to explain, is a self-supervised uh, learning task where you are try just trying to predict, is my image, by how, um, 
by what angle, sorry, is my image rotated? So by this very simple task, you're able to learn image representations and you can later use for fine tuning for unsupervised methods. So pretty interesting. So there have been obviously more complex uh, objectives like in the cluster um, that have been produced and, and the literature for self-supervision is, is very big at the moment. Um, so another thing that happened is that transformer, uh, transformers <laughs> sorry, were a thing for, became a thing for vision. Uh, so with VIT uh, being uh, uh, published in 2020. And that was very interesting because suddenly you are not just looking with CNNs, we were looking at local information. So the pixel around my pixel. And so you have information about what is happening around the pixel of interest. But with transformers, uh, now you can attend, every patch can attend to any patch in the image. So you can have, you can correlate things that are far away in the image. And that was very interesting for context purposes and for, for just thinking of the problem a bit differently. Um, and so, but transformers were great or are great, but I have a problem that they are quite hard to train. So you need either a very big data set, uh, millions of images that have been labeled, or there have been solutions recently of trying to help with the training with, uh, by doing pre-training learning uh, using self-supervised objectives. So MoCo, Dino, and MAE are just a selection in those uh, latest. And here again, the literature is very big. Um, and every time you have a different objective, but the idea is the same, you have a proxy task as you try to define the best to learn a good representation. So in this talk, I will talk a lot about Dino, which has shown to have a very good um, localization properties. So just you know uh, how it's trained, it's you have one image, you have two crop of this one image, and basically you have a student and teacher model that are trying to predict the same classes for this one, those two different crops. Um, the teacher is uh, an average, move, a moving average of the student, um, and that's it. So that's a very simple uh, objective. And it was very interesting because if you can see at the bottom, um, when you have a point on your on your bottle, like on the on the left, top left here, the red point, um, you can see the attention map of that point with regards to all of the upper, other patches, and you can see that all of the bottles are appearing. They are localized. So when we saw this, we so obviously uh, Dino highlighted that in the paper. The authors, Karen et al, highlighted that in the paper. Uh, so the localization properties are really interesting. Uh, there was this one work as well that um, is pre pretty interesting that is uh, deep bit features as dense visual descriptors and what they did here is that uh, they took Dino and they observed uh, the patch features in um, so here is a TSN visualization and they compared it to a supervised bit so it's supervised with classif classification task but if you look at uh, the the feature space in the supervised uh, setup, you have um, patches that are local that are grouped by classes. So you can see that you have subgraph that are basically different classes in, in data sets. But when you look on the left hand side, you can see in the graph or in the feature space that your patches are localized by type of patches. So torso are on the bottom right. Um, you have uh, the legs on the bottom left. So that's very interesting. Dino indeed is really uh, including a lot of uh, information. So in this presentation, I will talk to you about how to exploit the self-supervised features to produce object mask uh, in the first part. Then we will talk about how to improve those, uh, those predictions uh, using learning. And finally, can we go from uh, class agnostic to class aware? What are the solutions? So let's start. <clears throat> Sorry. So if you look at a Dino paper, this is the first figure. Um, and so when I, when I looked at it, I was like, okay, localization is done, right? So you have your bird is very well localized. You have your toothbrush is very well localized. So this is the uh, self-attention map of the last layer of the transformer. And so I was, I was very impressed with those results. Um, obviously there is a bit more to it. Uh, so those, those self-attention map are produced by using the keys and queries features in the last attention layer. And uh, what you can see here is one uh, selected uh, attention map in the different heads. So the way the multi-attention head is working is that you have several heads 
And uh, here they basically cherry picked or they picked some uh, visualization for, for the images. And so if we look at actually more complex images uh, with uh, more objects and uh, maybe um, uh, yes, just more di different scenes, then if you look at the different heads, the attention, it's not obvious where it's looking at. So if you look at the, the top row, it's, it's mainly focusing on the car, but where on the car, we don't really know. Sometimes it's quite noisy. On the bottom row, it's sometimes focusing on, it's focusing on the person and on the dog. And so looking at a different head, so looking at this, it was hard to know uh, how to exploit this directly. Instead, what we did was to look at the key queries and value features that are interesting that are producing those self-attention map and and uh, by doing so we do not require to make any decision on the heads um, what we observed is that the keys in particular have a very good correlation properties and that uh, the features for the object patches are more discriminative than the one for the background patches and that's one uh, thing that we observed that we are going to use a lot during this presentation Basically, the features for the object have more to it than the one to, for the background, which are more uniform. Uh, so object patches are less correlated uh, to other patches um, than background patches. Uh, so most of the methods that we're going to see now are requiring a graph of patches features. So how do we build this one? So we have our image, which is cut into N patches. It's going through a frozen self-supervised backbone. At the end, we have our feature tensor. Um, we are here looking at the future space. So obviously it's a very high dimensional space, but I represented it with three, uh, only three axes, um, but imagine it uh, in a much larger scale. Um, okay, and what we do then is that we consider every node and every node is becoming, uh, every patch story is becoming a node of our graph. The edges are the cosine similarity, which is a dot product between the descriptor for each patch. So uh, each, um, each node is uh, compared to all of the other patches. Um, and then we connect patches that only have a positive cosine similarity. So that are correlated. We don't care about patches that are decorrelated. Okay, so doing so, we are able to have our graph, which is not fully connected, it's sparsely connected. Uh, it's binary, so we are just going to say one, one or zero on the edges. Um, and for visualization purposes, for the rest of the presentation, I will uh, not have the edges represented, but keep in mind that they are here. Um, okay, so when we look at our graph, we can see really distinctively three different parts, and that's what we are going to try and find with our methods. Um, so the first one is uh, one that we proposed in, uh, at the MVC 2021, so just following Gino, you know, um, where we use two assumptions. The first one is that foreground patches are less correlated than background patches, so that was the idea I told you just before and that there are less patches of objects and background in the image. So that's quite a strong hypothesis that is discuss, excuse, discutable, sorry, but uh, it works for most data set that we are currently using. So we use a very simple concept. We use the information of degree. What is a, a, a degree? The degree of a vertex is a number of edges that are connected that, to the node. So here you have a degree two and five on those two uh, patches. And so we compute the degree for every node and what we observe. So in the background, the patches have a higher degree than in, uh, for when they are on the object. Um, so we use exactly that to uh, set the object seed as the patch with least uh, uh, lowest degree, the, pass, the patch the least connected. When, so that was, for instance, here focusing on the head, that works quite well. And then what we did was to select the similar patches to this one, and then to further extend the regions to those similar uh, patches. The further extension was important to have the entire object, otherwise we will just get a part of it. Um, okay, so the benefit of this method is that it's very quick, very easy. Uh, the computation is 60 frames per second on a single GPU, so very quick to compute. It, we, we achieved significantly better results than uh, inter-images methods that have this correlated cost. But in terms of limits here, we are only talking about single object detection. Uh, we have issues when objects cover most of the image. 
okay? And uh, we are achieving a coarse mask. So it's not the best mask that you have ever seen. Um, then following last, there was token cuts that was uh, introduced as VPR 2022. Um, that used a, a, an assumption quite similar to ours, which is that foreground objects can be segmented to, uh, into self-similar regions. And uh, do, using this assumption, they used the normalized graph cut problem, uh, which is simply as following. Uh, you want to cut your graph into two uh, sets of, of uh, graph. So you want to do a B partition where you have the minimum uh, similarity between your two sets and the maximum intra similarity within your two sets. So they solve this uh, by, so this is, so you might search for different solution and that would be, for instance, an optimal solution. Uh, so they solve this way using uh, spectral clustering. So using the first eigenvector. Uh, I invite you to go to the paper. It's well described uh, how they do it and uh, it's a nice read. Um, and now given this B partition, uh, we want to see, we want to know what is the object. So obviously we want to uh, detect um, the, B part, the partition corresponding to the, to the object. And what they propose is that uh, you basically select the patch with the least connection again. And the set that includes this, uh, this um, patch is the object. And so they achieved good result as well. In terms of benefit, we have with token get a more refined localization. The masks are uh, better. Uh, we are still obviously better than inter-images methods. And they also have shown quite interesting uh, generalization property to different features. So we had studied things only on Dino and they showed that it can work on Moco and other self-supervised features. Um, in terms of limits, so is there still single object detection and they require to compute eigenvector. So it's a bit slower than what we had before. A very related work is deep spectral method that was published also at CVPR 2022 last year, where uh, additionally in their graph, they uh, in employed handcrafted uh, features, so they use some pixel level information. Um, CVPR 2022 was quite a big year for unsupervised object localization. Um, okay. And one extension of token cut is published this year at CVPR is a uh, mask cut, where the idea, so it's in the Cutler paper, and mask cut idea is that you are, token cut is great, and it feels like you could discover more than one object. And what they, how they propose to do that is to, so you have your B partition that you had before, you have your set of patches that are the object, and what you can do is you remove it from the graph, and then you go again. You compute your um, you compute your B partition again and again, and they do it three times. So there is a bit here the assumption that you have more than one object in your image. They have some heuristic to say this is maybe not um, not an object. What uh, the heuristic that they are using is object centric prior, where the the idea is that the foreground set contains less than two of the four corners. So it's quite handcrafted uh, heuristic, but anyway, it works enough. Um, and so in terms of benefits, here they are doing uh, several object localizations, so that's very interesting. They also have the good quality of um, localization that TokenCat has. Um, and, but in terms of limits, we can ask are all of those detected objects really objects? And they require to compute like a vector a few times in an iterative process. Okay. Um, Still, CVPR 2022 last year uh, is self mask, which um, I find interesting because, uh, sorry. Oh, okay. I find interesting because they show that you can use uh, different self supervised features, that they all have their own properties that will look, they will localize more certain objects or more certain other, other objects. And here, what they propose is you have different features, uh, pre trained methods, pre trained uh, models, sorry. For each of them, you apply spectral clustering, you find your B partitions. And then you can, uh, with a simple voting scheme, find the one that is the most popular. Uh, so they do that and they obtain a good mask at the end. So in terms of uh, benefits, they leverage uh, several self-supervised features. So that's interesting. Um, in terms of limits, you need to do forward pass into different models that has some cost, and you still need to compute eigenvector, which still has some cost. Um, and this was a single detection. 
Um, free mask is slightly different um, in because they are at that point just using the attention. So they are um, they are using the assumption that you might not need so you might use the attention um, mechanism, which is well uh, defined to given a certain query, find what is matching in the keys. And so what they propose to do is uh, to consider every query patch to compare them to every uh, keys and to obtain uh, the number of uh, queries um, patches, they obtain uh, that number of masks. And then what they propose is to sort those masks and to use an NMS-like uh, solution to filter out the masks that they don't, don't want that are repeating and that are overlapping. Doing so is, is pretty interesting um, because they are able to, to highlight the several objects we are here getting closer to the instance. They are able to produce a mask per object. Um, and so in terms of limits, however, they have some noise. Um, the mask, again, uh, it's hard to know what, what is the object or not. And they have, um, they propose a type of objectness computation, but that is not uh, that clear. You have no annotation here. So it's very hard to define. So it's, it's hard to filter out uh, the bad mask in, in their method but uh, it's producing already pretty good results. Um, a final work that is just using uh, features as they are uh, is found. So found we're presenting it this year at uh, CVPR 23. Uh, and here we are trying, we're just thinking the problems the other way around. So people are trying to find objects, but then it means that you need to know how many objects they are, uh, what maybe what type of object you need to have some priors about they just, they shouldn't be more than two edges of the image, which is quite limiting. Um, and so here we just thought, okay, what about just if we were looking for the background instead of the object? And doing so basically, we are able to highlight what is not background, which by definition will be object. And so we use a very simple assumption, which is a background receive little attention in the self-supervised features. So we take our attention maps, we find our background seed, which is a patch with least attention. And then we find what is matching to the background, to the background seed. And that's it, we got our foreground. So that's very, very quick to compute. Um, it highlights several objects, uh, but in terms of limit, there is no clear instance. We don't separate the object and the masks are quite coarse, but we'll see later that through training, we can really use that. So some results now, how does this method work? So you have on the right results uh, visualization that this I uh, took from token cut paper, where you can see lost and, um, and uh, token cut. And you can see that they are able to detect objects, um, de de actually detect different objects. One is going for the tree, one is going for the person on the top image. Um, but the detection are pretty good. You also have here at the bottom free mask output. So you can see that they have a mask per object, although the mask is quite coarse. Uh, and in terms of quantitative results, uh, what we found pretty interesting is that on VOC, uh, on VOC 07, 12, and COCO, basically we achieved 70% of uh, quality. So 70% of the masks are good. And that's quite high for an unsupervised method. Um, on COCO, it's uh, 60, and COCO is known to be harder. You have lots of small objects. It's, it's quite difficult. Um, so those results are pretty impressive for a method that requires no training and that just exploits something that has been trained by somebody else to do a task that is different. Um, so there are also simple ways to refine the predictions um, that are using uh, pixel level information. Um, and those are bilateral solver and conditional random field that you can apply directly. They require no, no training. And they're allowed to go from, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a coarse mask that you can see in the middle uh, because you are, you are limited by the patch resolution, right? So patch is between eight and 16 uh, pixels. So that's quite large. Um, and by using bilateral solver here, they're able to produce this very fine looking mask that is uh, really highlighting, I think we can see the dog uh, hair. So it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Uh, in terms of limits, it's cross-processing, so it has some costs in terms of speed. Um, so takeaway for this first part is that it's possible to discover objects with no annotation by using those um, self-supervised features. Um, it's easy to discover a single object. It's harder to go to several. 
Um, and we got interesting performances on Vuk and Coco. What remains to be seen is how to go for a successful multi-object detection, how to exchange information at the data set level. We have those data sets, they are here, we know they are repeating objects, how to use that. Um, and so in general, how to refine results. So let's now go to uh, the second part, which is improving through learning. Um, and in this part, I'm going to talk to you about just the idea that, so you have your images, your data set. Sorry, I was too lazy. I put three times the same one, but imagine different images. Um, and for each of those images, you produce uh, pseudo labels, which will be course masks. Um, and the assumption is that with training, we can go from single object discovery to multiple object localization, and that training will help with smoothing out mistakes. And so what, uh, what many me uh, methods have proposed is to train the model by using those pseudo labels as pseudo ground truths uh, to train the model that you want to, to produce. And you might want, for instance, an object detection model. Uh, so you might put, instead of object detection model, you can put FAST or CNN or your favorite object detector um, and use uh, the pseudo so labels as ground truths. Um, and here, what you simply do is that you had a mask and you, you just fit a mask to the biggest, to the largest uh, connected component uh, in your mask. You just fit yeah, a box, sorry. Uh, and by doing training, you can go to multi-object detection and you also achieve better boxes. So we had proposed in Lost uh, to use a class agnostic detector, which uh, was in our case faster as CNN. We didn't do anything to it. We just took out of the shelf. Um, and it really, we were really impressed by the result uh, that allowed for us to reach um, those types of detection that you have on the bottom left. Um, where you have multi objects in your image detected. And in terms of uh, results, uh, quanti uh, quantifiable results, if you look at lost and token cut plus CAD, you are uh, between plus three and plus seven points uh, just by training a model to do. So uh, the better results, the most impressive results are on Coco, obviously, where it's harder. Um, and so basically, it's pretty interesting to see that with a simple uh, scheme, with just training a detector, it will have only one box per image during training, but it still is able to regularize. And so you, your boxes are better, and it's also able to find more objects in your image. Um, if you are this time interested in foreground segmentation, so you just want the object, one single mask per object, um, there are, they are some works. So the first one is self-mask. Um, <clears throat> so we've discussed before about how they produced the course mask with the different self-supervised features. And here, what they propose is to learn an encoder-decoder architecture, sorry, to produce mask at a higher resolution. Um, and they have shown that by learning, they are really having a great boost. I think it's yeah, plus 14, 16 points. Uh, so it's very impressive. And in terms of architecture, again, they didn't do anything very uh, particular. They just use a mask former, uh, which has an image encoder, a pixel decoder, and a transformer a decoder, where you have queries that you will learn through uh, training. And then you learn to score those queries based on your pseudo ground truth. So they achieved really good results, and they have been used subsequently by Overworks as well, because the training is quite, is quite smooth. So um, I talked to you before about found, how we discover by using the background, the objects. Um, and what we did, it was a very, I don't know, very simple idea. I was thinking, why do we need to train a very big detector, segmenter? Um, Dino is already having all of the information we need. So why not just having a seagull conv11? So we propose to train a model, which is a conv11, which, which role is to say, is this foreground or background? That's it. Um, and we used to train it to the, the pseudo label mass that we achieved before. And by doing so, with a two hour training, uh, on a single GPU with no notation, we were able to achieve state of the art results. The inference runs at 80 frames per second. So obviously here we are not talking about instances, we are not really separating the object, but we are really highlighting all of the objects in the image. So that was, I was we were quite happy with the results. Um, another work I would like to highlight, which is MOVE that it was presented at uh, NeurIPS um, last year. 
uh, they are doing um, something a bit different. They are thinking about with the concept of if you have a good mask, you can remove what is in the mask, you inpaint with some background uh, pixels what was uh, before the mask. And then if you pass again your mask somewhere else in the image, you should, a discriminator shouldn't be able to see that that's a fake image. So they train this way a discriminator to, see, to say is it fake or not. Um, and by doing so, they achieve pretty good results. Their, their mask producer is just a segmental model, which is a VIT. Um, I think they tried Dino and MAE, plus a CNN, CNN head um, that generates ob object mask. And then they have this discriminator that say yes or no, it is fake or true. And they achieve yeah, good results. There was also a redo that was uh, presented at New Apes 2019, which uh, is on a similar idea. This time they were using a, a GAN-based method um we have a pretty similar concept okay so now we have seen how we can do foreground uh, segmentation but what about if we want instances we want to separate objects um there has been two works that i would like to highlight here so free solo was last year's tvpr and what they propose is that we've seen their free mask that they generate just using um, the attention um, and then they proposed to train uh, a solo model, which was one of their prior work, that, um, that is going to do instant segmentation. Um, but they observed a few things that the, during training, the, the training was not really smooth. And so they reduced the loss from a fully supervised loss to a weekly supervised loss, where they are not going to train with a mask level annotation, but with box. So they are just fitting a box to uh, the masks that they have, and they try and force uh, the model to learn the good mask with those box level annotation. They also added a pairwise uh, affinity loss, which is working with the idea that two uh, close pixels should have a same class. And so with those, uh, with those just few tweaks, they were able to achieve uh, good training and to obtain results that you can see here, which I find quite, quite pretty. Um, so that was really good. Um, and an, an update on, on free solo is Cutler, um, which is presented this year at VPR. Uh, as I was saying before. And here again, they are training, they are taking off the shelf, Mascar CNN, Cascade uh, Mascar CNN, that are doing instant segmentation. And uh, they have a few tricks to make it work. The first one is that they will drop the loss for predicted, for predicted, uh, predicted regions, sorry, that are matching any to the mask. Doing so, they are not they don't want to handle the noise that you have in the pseudo mask because you don't want to force every pixel to be exactly like the coarse mask are because it might be a bit noisy. So that's helpful with that. They also have a copy pasting augmentation scheme uh, that help them with uh, having more data basically. And they also propose something which is, I guess, quite simple to think of, but works quite well and has interesting properties. It, they propose to train several times. So they do a first training now they are able to achieve multi-object uh, discovery, uh, multi-instance uh, segmentation, and they have better results. So then they take those, uh, pseudo, those uh, predictions, sorry, uh, they take the better ones, and they are going to go again with training. And they do that three times. And what they have shown is that by retraining again and again with better and better pseudo labels, what, what happens is that you're able to find more objects. And so this is what you can see here, where in the round two and three, you are able to achieve uh, up to 3 million instances versus 2.5 in the first round. So pretty, pretty nice. Um, so that's it for the training part. So what we've seen is that uh, with training, you can boost, boost release the performances and you can regularize any mistakes that you were doing before. You can also go from single to multi-object detection localization. Uh, but now the question are how to further improve results. You, may, you are also limited by the abilities of the self-supervised features. So you are constrained by them because you're not doing any retraining there. Every time they, those features were frozen. And also what about classes? So, okay, so we've seen that. So let's go to class aware. What can we do? I will not go into much detail here. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot. 
Um, okay, so the methods are all using Dino, which is trained on ImageNet. ImageNet, we all know it, it's quite curated, somebody can argue, so it's maybe some type of supervision there, but um, it has a very constrained domain. And we've found, and Tokakot also shows that, you can really go to out of domain uh, images and you can detect things that are cartoons, that are objects that are unexisting in the world or will never be seen in ImageNet. Um, and so the properties are pretty interesting. So we, we find really objects without knowing what we have, without having strong constraints about what an object is. Um, but now if we want to assign a class uh, to, to those masks, there are two solutions that are quite straightforward. Um, the first one is considering close vocabulary. So you already know the set of classes you are interested in. You are in the VOC or COCO 2080 classes. Um, and what you can do is take your mask. For each mask, you take a descriptor with Dino. You put that into your feature space. You apply k-means. We, you define k as a hyperparameter. Unfortunately, you, you cannot really avoid it. And then you find your clusters in your in your graph, and you are able to assign um, each um, mask a class. So that was very simple way to do it. We tried, and it works quite well. Um, then they are obviously now up, we were maybe more interested in open vocabulary, and here you can do something quite similar, which is you take your mask, you go to clip. Uh, and you maybe try and get a descriptor for your mask, and then you can try and, and fit it to your vocabulary that you will have with, with text. And um, I would like just to highlight two works that are uh, presented at CVPR, which are doing some, sorry, something alongside this. Uh, the first one is zero shot unsupervised transfer instance segmentation, where they try and propose a unified semantic and instance segmentation. And there they use a frozen text encoder. That produce, to produce a set of text features. So unfortunately here you are still limited by a finite set of text features. It's hard to have the, the entire world to you, but they achieve good results and are able to do open world um, uh, segmentation. Uh, another work is uh, zero shot referring image segmentation, where in this work, um, they, it's a bit different because the task here is you have an image, you have some text and you want to know where in the image is the text that you're talking about. But what they propose here is to use free solo to generate the mask. And then using a global uh, local similarity, uh, they are able to, um, to assign a particular patches to a certain text. So a, par a particular mask to certain te text. So um, yes, yeah, so that was quite interesting. So uh, that concludes my, my talk. So in terms of conclusions, uh, what we have seen is that it's possible to discover objects with no annotation. Um, it's quite easy to extract, uh, to, to use methods to extract uh, for single object uh, localization um, uh, properties from the Dino features, for instance. That we've seen that training boosts uh, results and increase the number of localized objects. Um, and finally, that it's possible to assign a closed open class to mask boxes. Um, in terms of remaining issues, um, obviously, how can we further improve results? Um, we are already, if I re remind you, we are in a fully unsupervised setup, so we're already achieving pretty decent uh, results. Um, but we are still limited by the abilities of the self provided features. So could we think of a way to um, produce representation that will be directly tackling the, the task of uh, object localization? Um, and actually, Thomas will be later talking to you about exactly about this. Uh, so that's it. Uh, questions. Yeah, sorry, I think he was he was first. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I had a question about models like Dino. Mm -hmm. um, so these are using object centric images, yeah. which already gives a hint yeah. as in to what's foreground, what's back background. Um, wh what do you think would be like, how, how would you say like these could be extended to 3D where you have like a 3D scene like here, you have the point cloud representation of it, mm -hmm. and there's no hint into like, what are the foreground and, and background? 
Uh, that, that's a very good question. And it's a remark that comes a lot with uh, reviewing process um, that uh, Dino is curated and uh, therefore includes a certain um, level of supervision. Um, so I'm not working on the task of self-supervised itself, uh, self-supervised learning itself, sorry. Uh, but I know there are work that are trying currently to go beyond ImageNet and to try and explore. Um, I think the 3D world that you described can be a good, uh, a good cue uh, producing uh, space. Um, in particular, I don't know about indoor, but in outdoor, you can really use unsupervised methods to localize, localize segments. So you could use that to maybe crop your image around that object, for instance, and you could use that sort of type of hints. I don't know about indoor, I'm not that familiar with it, but I think that's, that's, a, good, that's a good comment. And I, I hope that there will be more work working on going in beyond ImageNet. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my question is about your state-of-the-art method, which is called font. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I and I and I see that your method is based on a very important uh, assumption mm -hmm. that uh, the background tend to attract little or less attention of the of your pretext uh, model, mm -hmm. right? Like Dino. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, are there any theoretical supports for, for this assumption? Um, no, they are not. And I think even in the why keys and not queries and not values uh, features uh -huh. is like still a question ongoing. I think uh -huh. it's quite linked to maybe the previous question. Um, ImageNet has, uh, is object centric, you have your image and basically through training, what I assume is happening is that the model is going to learn to ignore uh, in the crop decision making, like what, trying to produce one class per, for the two crops. Finally, the background is not going to give a lot of information. So I assume that through training is going to learn to, to assign little attention to that. But um, that's very empirical. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I have no idea of the time. Yeah, did I go first? Okay, yeah, go for it. Um, I appreciate this is uh, unsupervised or self-supervised learning, mm -hmm. which is you know very impressive and exciting, but with models like the segment anything model out there, yeah. um, should I just use that and hope <laughs> that it will segment the objects that I'm interested in? Uh, do, can you use that as like a starting point or compare how your results do to something like that? Mm -hmm. which, uh, which should I use? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I guess the more than anything is supervised. So I expect the mask to be better. I don't think we are comparing to segment anything in terms of results. I think it depends what you want to do. I do think that we can do an unsupervised segment anything. I think that it's possible, okay. um, but um, in terms of yeah, in terms of performances, segment anything has a lot of well-designed uh, tricks and annotation that have been made by humans. So I guess I will start with this. Right, right, okay, and then maybe fine tune it a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, something like that. The, those methods are, I think, those methods are great in in the helping uh, discovering any objects that in segment anything there was a nice talk yet yesterday and they said that the problem that they had is that during training the annotator has to select a mask mm. and there was a strong bias because uh, annotator were mainly focusing on objects that they like mm. so person uh, car things that they that they will tend to look at and so what they had to do at some point is to try and come up with a solution. So they pre-annotated all of those objects and then ask the annotator to, to annotate the rest. So, but I guess you always have to, this problem, which is where does the human eye go? And can maybe those type of model be uh, helping with actually not being biased by human supervision? Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, actually, it's related to the, the the answer you just made to the previous question. Um, one of the interesting uh, usage of all these uh, fully and supervised and sometimes fast methods for uh, letting objects pop up is uh, in the context of annotation. Mm -hmm. So, as a tool to 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 speed up the task and to help the annotator. Uh, so, 
could you give a bit of context on the use of these methods uh, within a data pipeline with human annotator uh, process? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, and that's, that's, that's also a place where segment anything is used in the pre annotation. Um, yeah, I guess I guess when you want to help the annotator doing a very uh, annoying task, uh, which is to give every pa every patch, every pixel a label, um, having a predefined method that will uh, highlight where to focus on, and then you'll ask the annotator, okay, within this mask, where are my objects? What are they? Then this this will be indeed helpful. Um, but yeah, I think those methods are just very helpful in getting out of the bias of, of uh, humans and maybe trying to help uh, in general um, to, to think of the object a bit differently uh, out of what we must, come, must frequently come up with. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I don't know if online, oh yeah, go for it. Uh, hi, a quick question. Do you think that the underlying assumption about the attentions would hold, for example, in medical imaging, where your foreground is abnormalities and the background would be healthy regions in image for CT scan, MRI scan, just as ray, for example. Yeah, and I, I believe one of the first uh, person to cite lost was a medical paper. Um, uh, that was quite, I was quite happy with that. Um, I think it has been shown that, for instance, Dino can generalize to uh, medical imaging, uh, which is maybe a very di different domain space. But what you need is our presentation of the edges, et cetera, that it maybe is already in Dino. So yes, for sure. And you might have, I don't know, do you have like already uh, super defined uh, self-supervised features that are have been only trained for medical imagery? Those? Uh, you can assume that you already know the labels. I mean, you know the the options you know mm -hmm. the, for example you have a finite vocabulary of different abnormalities but you want to discover the the grounding where, where it is in the image yes yes um i i do think that they could work i i don't know exactly how uh, yes. like this but uh yeah i think that could uh, there has been already works that show good generalization properties okay thank you yeah no worries um are there questions online no I, I saw one question in chat, but yeah. I'm still waiting for clarification because I'm not sure which part of your presentation refers. So I'll, I'll wait for a, one more moment. I have a question in the meantime, actually. Uh, first of all, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I was wondering if, like, for any of the methods you presented, there has been a focus on evaluation, maybe in some, some other papers, the people that is follow-up work beyond uh, localization and, and segmentation, like have people looked into whether these kinds of representations you get out of these like clusters, for example, give you certain benefits for other downstream tasks like uh, visual question answering or something like that. Visual question answering. Uh, I don't know about visual question answering. Um, they have been, token cut proposed an extension to videos where they also include optical flow um, and are evaluating so on videos, which is a, a bit beyond image. Um, I guess with text it's, it's it's coming. Uh, so there are already those two papers that are presented at CVPR, and I will expect more work to align text and uh, image images. Um, but out of my head like this, um, I don't I don't know exactly. So except the two one that I presented before, um, I wouldn't be able to say. Oh, I think yes, there was uh, maybe Wadey. Uh, you will talk about it. You had the work that is. Um, that is uh, using both clip and Dino, right? Oh, wait, yes. online, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, so I guess you might talk about it uh, later. Uh, yeah. What was your se second question, Thomas? Oh, I uh, no, that was, that was my main question. Um, ah. I was just wondering because, like, in, 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 the, in the methods we're going to present later, indeed, there have been these. Uh, like other downstream applications, but for these kind of token cut style approaches, I haven't really seen that. So I was wondering. Uh, thanks. I'm so there's one more question online. Um, the question is by Anirud, and it's on uh, what does the correlation mean with respect to the actual task at hand, such as segmentation, for example? I think it was like pretty early in your presentation. Um, I'm what not, does, maybe maybe you yeah. know what it's about. <laughs> what does correlation? Not decorrelation, correlation, right? What what does uh, this correlation mean with respect to the actual task at hand? Um, so, 
correlation, uh, I guess the, the way I, I see it is positive similarity. Um, so things are correlated when they have when they are similar and that you can compute that uh, with uh, cosine similarity, for instance. Yeah, I think that, that answers it. Thanks. We, we have a question in the room as well. Yeah, go for it. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I, I just had a question. So in many of the examples that you shared, um, it's like a holistic object that's being segmented. Um, can you give any insights on how you might want to segment parts of objects? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, when I was playing with founds, I was I tried different ways to learn uh, the segmentation. And at some point, I tried something where you have automatic um, automatic you learn to uh, automatic cent centroid so through training you hope to learn centroid that will represent your object i, I tried something like this and uh, that's quite related to the first work that is to, that was showing the torso and the parts of the object in the in the space what i observed is that very quickly what i had was parts actually and i think so that's why segment anything i think can be done in a supervised fashion um you really have you will highlight uh, so through training i saw that appearing before going to object you had this uh parts that were very easily extractable from from Gino. so i think maybe this first paper can be a good first place to start from uh yeah but definitely i think it's possible thank you thank you yeah yeah uh, uh, hello, thank you for your uh, great talking. And I have a question that mm -hmm. in my in my experience, uh, I I I use I use a very naive uh, method to uh, discriminate the foreground and the background. Mm -hmm. And I find when uh, when I come to some examples that there are I'm sure there are only one object in the image, but sometimes it will go to the background. For example, if there are a man before a tree, and and the, the model do. It may focus on the tree in, in, in some, some, some occasions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you mix? Do you make some uh, failure examples uh, when the model say focus on the uh, background, not the foreground you expected? And and what do you think? Why this is coming and how to solve it? Yeah. That, that's a good question. I, th I think uh, there is a strong assumption in the work that we have shown is that um, you want you expect background to be uh, highly correlated, quite uniform representation throughout all the patches. But if you have an object that is smooth, I will expect this to be picked up because uh, then basically the you when you're considering the least attention or the most uh, correlation, it will go to the smoothest uh, zone in the image. Um, so that's a good point. And I think that, quite, that can be fixed through training. So um, I was thinking about also when your object is, uh, you, most of the image is the object. Uh, and sometimes when you have no object, uh, you still, uh, we found for instance, when you have no object, you will still have a segmentation, which you don't want. Um, and I think through training with negative examples, um, so showing empty images and saying, there is nothing here, you can uh, maybe tackle this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have another question. Mm -hmm. So does this kind of models can handle a multi-object detection? Like, let's say, let's imagine if we want to do a, a counting people system in the room and people in, sitting in the front are larger than people sitting in the town. So this kind of models can solve this task? So you mean scale, uh, yeah. if we have different scales. Um, I think they have methods that are like trying to explore scale. Um, free mask is one of them when they have queries of different scale. Um, and that, that, that's a good point. That's something that I think can be enforced. Maybe it's not designed, those methods are not designed for it. However, we found, for instance, we, we, we show that we were able to localize quite small objects. Um, yeah, I don't have the image here, but people doing on the field, uh, doing playing football with different scales, and we were still able to, to separate them. If you have a crowd like this, which is quite dense, um, I don't know how well the performances will be. I think, yeah, dense make it harder. So in that case, do, uh, do you recommend to use the uh, systems like Sam, right? Yeah, I, I think in general, uh, we are not competing with Sam here. I, I guess we, we might be at some points, but um, Sam generates so many more, but maybe too much segments actually. I guess for industrial, when you are just considering all of the segments, what is the object, what is not. So maybe Sam with something, with a bit of training to know what is the object, what is not, can be what you're looking for. But yeah, some segments are a bit better, I think. Thank you. 
there was one last question. I don't know, do we have time? Okay, let's just be the last one. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, I think my question is more about uh, how, how you evaluate these methods. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I guess it's the fact that for, for, let's say, sparsely annotated data sets like Pascal and even Coco, mm -hmm. um, there, there is a question about what objects we, we care about finding as opposed to what the model may find. So yeah. uh, I, I guess the question is, have you, have you evaluated or considered evaluating models like that in more densely annotated data sets like Elvis, for instance, uh, to, to see whether mistakes that the models make, mm -hmm. let, let's say mistakes, mm -hmm. are actually mistakes or if they simply register objects that may not be of interest in the data sets that we typically evaluate, so desks and object parts. Stuff like that. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, um, we haven't, uh, I guess, because of time during submissions, you don't. But um, it's it's a very good point. And they most of the papers, when they show uh, uh, limits of, and they show, like, look, we have discovered something that was considered not an object in data sets. So basically trying to, so it, I think it will make a lot of sense, actually. That's, that's a good point, maybe Elvis is one way we should, we should evaluate all those methods. Yeah, okay. good points, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, this is done. So we have a break, 15 minutes break uh, right now, and uh, we'll come back for Thomas Kiff and Wei Di Shi uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, we will have the video online. The slides are not yet, but they will be published. Yes. Uh, uh, on the website, we'll put the um, video at least for sure, and hopefully the slide as well. Thank you. Hi. I have another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, oh, uh, yes, please. Yes. So, if we do optimal detection, we're just interested in mm -hmm. as good as possible. So, this is a great method of leveraging a lot of data that hasn't been annotated. Yeah. Uh, do you no, think actually, it's, it's not a would this be a good start to kind so of instead no, of pre training our image no to leverage matter. something like this to do pre training of the backbone? Uh, to would that yes. increase quality yeah. or reduce training? So you mean uh, so you will so you will yeah update the data sets yeah then I can still use it. Ah, yes. What would be the best way of getting the most out of these methods? I see. I see. To kind of yeah, no. what you already have. so you already have a backbone which has been trained uh, and uh, yeah. yeah. I'll just sorry. I'll just cut this because.
So, hi everyone, we are back. Um, may I invite everybody to take a seat, sorry, please, for the, the second part of the presentations. I just view, yes. I, so now we can see you, Thomas. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we do see your slides. I just uh, give me you show you open. Yeah, let's do it this way. Um, okay, so it's twenty exactly. Um, okay, so thanks uh, for staying with us. So we are going to go to the second part of uh, the the tutorial um, that will be held. Uh, the, Thomas is going to start. So Thomas Kiff um, is a senior researcher scientist at Google DeepMind. Um, he obtained his PhD at the University of Amsterdam, working with Max Whaling. Um, for his PhD thesis uh, on deep learning with graph structure representation, he received the Ellis PhD award 2021. So quite a big, quite a big award. So um, we are very happy with for your talk, uh, Thomas. So go for it. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, as Ariane mentioned, I'm, I'm Thomas. I'm a senior research scientist at Google DeepMind. And uh, today I'm going to talk about self-supervised learning with object-aware priors. And um, this talk is a little bit different, I guess, from like it marks a bit of a, a difference from the talks you've seen early in the tutorial in that we're now talking about kind of end to end trained uh, deep neural networks and um, how we can integrate particular priors into those architectures to get some of those benefits sort of for free that we've talked about earlier, um, which, which um, you could also approach via, say, for example, um, certain clustering techniques or via, uh, via, via for example, pseudo labeling uh, strategies. And so here we're really going to talk about kind of end-to-end -end learning and, and how we can enrich neural networks with particular priors. Um, I, I also want to say, I'm, uh, I apologize that I couldn't make it in person. Um, this was kind of an unexpected thing that came in between, um, but I'm, I'm happy I can still give the tutorial uh, remotely. And we also have quite a few remote participants, as you can see. All right, so um, object-aware priors in deep learning. So the, the goal here is really to build uh, neural network models that can abstract and represent objects in their architectures, or like somewhere in the model. And uh, one, one question one might ask is why, why, why would this be an interesting goal? Why would we want to do that? And uh, so if you look at the world around you um, and like everyday kind of scenes in your physical environment, um, you, you quickly come to realize that the world is highly structured, at least like our everyday environments like you have, uh, like these images here, uh, traffic scenes where there's rich structure in terms of like cars and individual uh, traffic participants or, or animals, or even in this kind of toy object in this Newton's cradle example on the bottom right, um, there's this very rich kind of even hierarchical structure, like you can perceive the entire thing as this kind of an object, but also you can, you can richly reason about like, or imagine what's going to happen next, based just based on um, like the physical structure of this object um, and its particular components. And so um, that that raises a question: kind of why why do we care about um, objects in in say perception or in 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 the machine learning in general? And uh, one one particular aspect is that they're really core to human perception. So if you want to um, learn from, from human intelligence and human perception in any way, then um, one, one interesting phenomenon we should be able to model is, is, is like, are like objects and, and the things that they facilitate. Um, of course, it doesn't have to be something that has to be explicit somewhere in the model, but, but the model should facilitate um, learning those kinds of representations. And, and, and objects can also be directly useful for certain downstream tasks. Like, for example, you can have um, like detections that you get out of a, a detector model, and then you can use them in, in, in like some more classical pipelines or um, use them to plan like trajectories and self-driving cars and so forth. So, so just objects per se as a, as a kind of structure of a representation is a, is a really useful uh, kind of entity. And I don't think I have to convince you because it's a very 
uh, classical representation in, in computer vision tasks. And, and many computer vision tasks are built around localization of objects. And, and finally, um, one, one aspect that um, I think is often assumed uh, kind of um, implicitly is, is that these kinds of object representations are really good at facilitating interpretability as opposed to having like a, a big kind of deep neural net just producing some kind of like downstream output like a language output. If you have some kind of intermediate object representations, they really help you interpret kind of what's happening and how, how things are grounded. And at the same time, it buys you things like compositional generalization and data efficiency. Like if you, for example, want to simulate the world going forward, um, if you know how kind of one, if, you, if you've ever seen like two particular objects collide, you can immediately generalize to kind of objects of slightly different new appearance uh, and, and can imagine kind of how, how the future is going to roll out uh, in, in that kind of collision. And so um, there's kind of a rich history of, of studying object priors and, and objects in, in cognitive science. And, and this has really um, spawned also a, like a, a branch of the literature in machine learning um, that cares about integrating these object priors directly into neural network models. And um, very often like the, the kind of overall kind of framework looks a little bit like this. And I think this is a nice mental framework from this paper uh, the survey paper on the binding problem in neural networks from, from Klaus Graf and others, where basically you will have like on the one hand side some kind of unstructured input, uh, this could be an image, and you would like to segregate this kind of really unstructured high dimensional signal into a, into a structured representation. And um, like a very natural structured representation, so just say one representation vector per object. And of course, um, this really facilitates also like computer vision tasks like object localization, if you have a representation per object, um, then that representation must be bound somewhere to the image and then you can localize it and so forth. And so this problem of like how you can perform this information segregation, representation and composition is really the core problem uh, we want to address when building object price in neural network architectures. And the goal is often also then to learn about objects with minimal explicit supervision. But um, an interesting takeaway here is that these kinds of architectures, they don't really care if you kind of train them unsupervised or if you explicitly supervise them, if you have the labels, uh, you can basically do both. But if you don't have supervision and you have the right inductive biases, then you can also get objects for free. And that's kind of what we're here for today. And uh, another interesting aspect is that these methods are really kind of scalable via end-to-end -end learning and self-supervision, which is like one of the core recipes we've seen being successful for um, say large language models and um, like the recent success in generative AI, where really end-to-end uh, -end learning and self-supervision are the like two core ingredients. And um, if, you can, if you can get like the same kind of breakthrough for object localization without having to collect uh, massive data sets, and, and especially if you want to go to more complex setups like videos in 3D, this might be really beneficial. Now, um, object representations can be uh, can take various forms and shapes in, in neural architectures, and um, there are like over the years there have been more or less three main categories that um, the community has focused on, and there exist many other kind of less explored choices which I'm not going to go into detail about today. But the main categories really uh, the main categories really are uh, sequential slots, Bayesian slots, and instance slots. And I'm going to explain like the details in a moment. So for sequential slots, um, we typically assume we have an, an ordered sequence of vectors. And um, that is basically, a, a typical example could be you, you have an image and you, you extract one object at a time. And um, that is similar to kind of like a visual saccading mechanism where you like pay attention to one object, you abstract it, and you, you look at the next object and so forth. And, and one nice property of this is that um, it doesn't really matter um, how many objects in the, in, the, in the image you are, you can just sequentially go through all of them. And it's, it's therefore a pretty general mechanism. Um, then there are spatial slots, which, which are also very popular uh, in various architectures, and, and that they basically assume a grid of vectors. And this is basically a patch-based representation if you, have, um, if you have an image's input. And um, in those spatial slots, you would take, uh, like the, for example, the, the patch that um, captures most of the object and just say, okay, this is the patch that corresponds to the object and, and everything you care about reading out for the object, you read about from that, uh, you read out from that patch. 
And finally, there are instance slots. And those slots um, are effectively permutation invariant sets of vectors. And um, those are pretty popular these days because they reflect a, a property of objects in the real world. Like um, if, you, if you look at the world around you, um, objects, they don't really have, there's no particular meaning whether you assign a label one, two, or three to a particular object. So there's no particular natural ordering or global ordering that can apply to, to objects in the world. Um, and so um, as, like putting the same kind of symmetry we have in the world about objects into the representation, it's, it's one of those lessons um, in terms of like building neural network architecture is something that can buy you a lot of data efficiency. And so these methods basically you assume a set of vectors and you somehow route the input to these individual set limits. Now, if you if you think about like the supervised uh, literature on, on detection, you might recognize some of these earlier methods. And I'm going to explain a bit the connection in a, in a moment. But I would like to give a selective method overview of like earlier methods that have really tried to build um, neural network architectures with these inductive biases for, for unsupervised detection, unsupervised object learning, um, or even generative modeling. And so for sequential slots, you have methods like attend, infer, repeat, uh, or Monet that essentially have like an uh, iterative attention mechanism that um, at every time step extracts some object from the input, represents it, and then can uh, you can train it, for example, by just by self-supervision to, to decode that uh, final image again. You have spatial slots. Um, and for those, there are several techniques that uh, gain popularity. Um, and these typically um, involve learning a grid of uh, image vectors. And then um, you, for example, learn particular presence probabilities or like a, a depth ordering of the objects and um, a, a per grid thresholding that determines whether there's an object in this particular grid location or not. Um, so there's a lot of discreteness in these kinds of methods, which also comes with some problems, but they, they, the benefit of those approaches is that they can really scale to a lot of objects very easily. And finally, of instance slots, which I think is the category of methods in, in this part of the literature that has really gained most of attention recently. And um, one prominent example here was uh, iodine from 2019 uh, from Chris Greff and others, and, and later on slot attention, a method we've developed for um, iteratively by an attention mechanism, extracting objects and mapping them to a, a set of slots. So there are many, many more papers in this field. I'm going to cover a few more in the coming slides. But of course, this is not going to be an exhaustive uh, review of the field. Um, but any of the papers I'm linking here will be a good starting point if, you're, if you want to learn more about this area. So just want to highlight, um, before we go into the actual methods, what, what you can actually expect to get out if you, um, if you take any of those kind of latest methods that use instance slots and end-to-end -end kind of deep neural networks that, that include those kind of slot inductive biases, um, then um, these are kind of the, the examples of what, what people have, have built so far. So for example, um, for, for image data sets, you can, you can um, with these kinds of methods by now, and this is a very recent paper from iClear, get somewhat decent uh, like localization of, of multiple objects and multiple entities in an image. You can get um, 3D consistent representations, um, uh, even for like textured scenes or real world scenes like Street View these days. And uh, you can also get um, like, for example, in this way more open example here, get like segmentation and tracking of cars with, without any extra supervision on top. So before we go into some of those later methods, I, I want to start with uh, a few examples on like these early approaches, for example, for sequential attention. And so one particular um, impactful uh, example that I already mentioned earlier is Monet. Um, and that um, was one of the first methods that really um, made this kind of sequential attention process work to extract objects without supervision. And so ultimately what it does, it has an attention network and a representation network, this component VAE. And uh, it sequentially attends into the image and produces an attention mask that extracts uh, a particular object or a background or a particular kind of segment from the input. And then the component VAE encodes that into one latent variable. And um, then with, together with the mask and um, the reconstruction of the VAE, we can get a mass reconstruction of the image. 
And then basically step by step, the model um, continues by producing a new mask that now has to explain what hasn't explained before, hasn't been explained before. And so bit by bit, you get like an explanation of the entire image and, and you get like one component at a time. And um, one benefit of this is that this is really kind of agnostic to the sequence length. So you can, you can if like an image has a lot of objects, you can just run this model for many, many steps and it'll extract a lot of objects. But um, one, one downside is, and this is really like one of the main reasons why this hasn't uh, recently been adopted too heavily, is that it requires uh, n calls to an autoencoder to um, like extract n objects. And if you have 100 objects, that's a lot of calls from an autoencoder for a single frame. And if you imagine applying this to a video, this gets very, very expensive. And so um, that's where kind of spatial uh, slots come in that really break down the sequential process into kind of fully parallel uh, grid-based mechanism, which is which is quite very um, efficient on modern hardware. And so here, um, you effectively start again in this method space here from um, an input image. You represent that input image, for example, passing it through a CNN encoder um, as a grid of, of feature vectors. And then you parcelate those feature vectors, for example, in the presence probability in a kind of a depth variable and a, an x, y coordinate or latent variable for where the object should be in the image within with a relative to that particular patch. And then um, you, can, you can train the model via reconstruction by having some kind of bottleneck or prior on those, on those latent variables. Now, this scales to many objects uh, per scene, um, but it has the problem that effectively you have to put a prior on all these kind of details and you have a binary indicator per grid location that tells you whether an object should be there or not. And, and as you can imagine, these things are kind of brittle to optimize. And uh, you also have the problem that um, you have a certain kind of size prior. If you have objects that span the entire image, this is something that cannot be well represented with this kind of, um, with this kind of representation, at least not in a trivial way. And there are many kind of related methods like Spare, Scalar, and, and Simona. Simona is a method that uses transformers and uh, overcome some of those issues, but it's still somewhat limited in terms of its applications. And, and finally, we have uh, methods that um, map to instance slots. So this is kind of this representation where you start from, say, an image and you, you map to a set of, uh, set of vectors. And um, of course, if you, if you think about like the literature now um, in terms of supervised detection models, we've kind of, we, we had representatives of these different class of models, like for grid-based models, you have things like uh, faster RCNN uh, and these kinds of approaches or, or single or multi-stage detectors, uh, or two-stage detectors that effectively operate on a grid and then for every grid location um, predict some kind of objectness. Um, and then for instance slots, a particular representative that in a, in a supervised literature, of course, is very impactful was the detection transformer that it precisely kind of takes this paradigm of uh, representing um, a set of objects just as a set of vectors and predicting that uh, using a permutation symmetric architecture like a transformer. And uh, so here we go a little bit back in time um, to a method called, called iodine that um, was one of the methods that kind of pioneered this kind of set-based approach for object representations. And um, effectively what, what that paper did um, is it starts from like some initial guess, some initial initializations what these objects should be, and then iteratively refines that representation via a number of kind of decode and encode steps. So you, you kind of have the representation of what the object should be, you try to decode it, you look at um, how well it explains the image, you co compute some error and you encode it again to compute like a, a correction step. And over time, you uh, end up at like a crisp uh, decomposition of the image. Now, um, this is parallel and iterative. So you don't have like a linear dependency on the number of objects, which is great. Um, but one big disadvantage here is that it still requires multiple encode and decode iterations. You still, for every iteration here, you need to decode your latent variables, one for every slot, um, check with the input and encode it again. This you have to do like five times or so to, to Kind of slowly converge to, to a solution. And again, this is very expensive, especially if you want to run this, for example, on a video. 
And so in, in 2020, um, we looked at this, uh, the state of the literature at that time. And um, so we thought, okay, like these instance slots are really great, but to really make them usable, you need something that is much faster and uh, doesn't kind of rely on this like iterative encoding and decoding all the time. And uh, thanks to attention mechanism, um, we, can, we can effectively overcome this issue by uh, doing attention-based iterative grouping. And that's the core idea behind slot attention, where basically you, you can start from an, an encoded image that's passed for an encoder into a grid of vectors, but then you have an, a cross-attention mechanism from those initial latent slots that initially just have a random guess of what the object should be, and then iteratively just cross-attend into the input to refine um, the representation of the object. And after just a few, a handful of, of iterations, you end up at like a, a pretty crisp kind of grouping of what the object should be based on the input representation. And the nice thing about this is it only requires a single call to the encoder and to the decoder. So you, you don't have like an iterative dependency and the uh, attention mechanism here is very lightweight. So, so this is a relatively fast method. And uh, of course, it's very similar to what has been successful around the same time in, in supervised detection with detection transformers. And uh, I just would like to go a little bit more into detail in, uh, and look at how the uh, slot attention mechanism works uh, precisely, just to give you a bit of an understanding of what like, the core considerations are and how it connects to some other algorithms. And so in slot attention, um, you start by um, having like a, a set of input vectors. And these are usually the feature maps from your visual backbone. Like this could be a CNN, this could be a vision transformer. And uh, you obtain also uh, position embeddings. So up to this point, this is pretty much exactly the same as a detection transformer. And um, this is basically a set of vectors that describes the image grid. And now you start with, uh, you have to start with some kind of initialization for the, for the latent slots because they, uh, they don't come for free. They don't come from the image grid, for example. So you, you have to start with some way of initializing them. And um, one of the easiest ways is to, to just initialize them by drawing them from a normal distribution. Um, so completely at random, uh, you can do this either at every training or inference iteration, or you can do this just once at the beginning of training and then uh, fine tune or learn the, the initialization of these slots. And then for a number of iterations uh, from time steps zero to T, so these are the time steps you see in the right-hand side of the figure, um, we effectively do the following. So you have your inputs, so these are the uh, encoded input features. You have your completely random slots at this point, and you perform an attention mechanism by basically key transforming the inputs and que query transforming the, uh, the, the slots, and that, that's basically just a, a standard cross-attention mechanism. But then uh, when we compute the softmax over these normalized scores, so the tau here is a temperature normalization as, as we usually do in, in, in cross-attention, um, then we normalize the softmax over the slot axis. And so this is the core difference between uh, regular cross-attention, um, for example, to image features in, in a detection transformer and any kind of typical cross-attention mechanism, which is normalized over the input axis or the key axis, here we normalize over the slot or the query axis. And the reason we do this is um, because we want every slot to exclusively bind to particular areas of the input. And so the normalization here is visualized here. So it means that all the attention maps, they sum to one across the slots. And that means if one slot already explains an object, a different slot will be downweighted for that same object. And that's not the case in regular cross attention. And so um, effectively, this feels a bit like a clustering mechanism. So, so kind of slots have to commit to the particular objects they, they capture. And now, I mean, the reason why usually in cross-attention you normalize over the inputs is because otherwise, once you compute the updates using the weighted sum, things will explode uh, because you kind of have like an unnormalized sum. Um, and we fix this in slot attention by renormalizing that sum. Um, so instead of a weighted sum, which would be just multiplying the weights with the value transform inputs in the sum, we, we perform a weighted mean, which, which means we, we also normalize over the sum of the weights. Um, and with that renormalization, things get stable again. And then we can write the updates to the slots. And we do this with a learnable gated recurrent unit, but in principle, any other kind of learnable mechanism would, would work here. Um, but a gated recurrent unit is nice and stable because we actually share parameters over these iterations. 
Again, this is a choice that's not absolutely necessary, but this is something we found nice as kind of an iterative optimization procedure. In practice, also when you implement this model, it's recommended to use like layer norm uh, on the inputs and the slots, but those are kind of just small details. Now to really understand what's going on here, it's, I think it's nice to make the connection to, to clustering. Um, and because we heard a lot about clustering in, in Oriana's talk earlier, um, it's nice to kind of see how this, this kind of differentiable module that now defines a lot of the kind of object discovery in end-to-end -end deep learning architectures, how this connects to more like classical clustering algorithms. And so the, the core difference here is really that, again, in clustering, we start by initializing the clusters in some kind of way um, here. Uh, we just call them slots and initialize them from a normal distribution. And then for a number of steps uh, in clustering, you would compute a Euclidean, a squared Euclidean distance usually, uh, or some other kind of distance function um, to obtain the scores. And again, you would compute um, in soft K means, um, which is differentiable, you would compute uh, responsibilities for each uh, cluster center to each input. And again, here, this corresponds to a soft max over the scores. Um, normalized over the slot axis. And uh, similarly, in, in um, soft k-means, you would do a weighted mean to aggregate the inputs. And finally, you just write the updates into the slots. And so um, the core difference between these two algorithms is really that in slot attention, we, we just sprinkle parameters everywhere and make everything learnable. Um, whereas in clustering, you would kind of directly optimize for like, uh, like minimizing the square distance between the clusters and all the inputs. And in slot attention, you minimize whatever distance function is useful for the downstream task. And so if the downstream task is reconstruction, then um, the, the kind of clustering you optimize for is like whatever makes reconstruction the easiest. Or if the downstream task is future prediction, we optimize whatever makes whatever clustering makes uh, future prediction the easiest. And, and so that is very beneficial because um, we don't have to rely on the inductive bias of the clustering algorithm alone, but we can really still learn um, learn, like flexibly learn in kind of what space we want to cluster. And this also explains why slots have to compete for explaining parts of the input uh, in slot attention. And so now if you look at how this model can be uh, kind of trained uh, without supervision, uh, which is the main reason we're here for today, um, of course, you can also train these models with supervision, so nothing prevents you from doing that. And in fact, methods like uh, the segment anything model um, which has gained a lot of popularity recently, um, has a very kind of similar structure. It uses kind of a set of latent slots and, and these kind of are directly supervised with mask supervision. And uh, so if you want to train this model now unsupervised, what you would do is you would take uh, uh, an image, pass it through CNN, apply the slot attention module. And then um, one of the easiest unsupervised tasks you can do is just reconstructing the input again. And um, now one question is like, how do we go from slots again to inputs? And uh, one solution for that is to apply a CNN decoder independently per, per slot um, and let the CNN decoder produce uh, also an alpha mask. Um, and then um, we, can, we can use those alpha masks to, to recombine the images into a single image and, and apply a reconstruction loss. So basically every slot decoder here reconstructs an RGB alpha image and uh, together they make up a single image that we apply the loss on. And um, so what, what, like this very simple method, uh, just by training it with autoencoding can, can do on these kind of relatively simplistic clever data sets is that first of all, it can obviously reconstruct the input, um, but that's sort of a big feat because it's like, there's no denoising happening or anything. It's just like a, an, a deterministic autoencoder. But on top of that, it, it learns to kind of cluster the scene in, in a very meaningful way. Like it learns to keep slots empty if they're not needed. Um, and it, it clusters the scene in terms of like the meaningful object components and, and even captures like occlusion properly. And like even if you now would delete number slot from uh, slot 11 from the representation here, what you would see is that uh, slot five is fully revealed and it would complete the sphere and then render the entire sphere. And that's something we, we know as amodal completion in human perception. And that's something that these models kind of naturally uh, do as well, which is quite exciting. So um, now one question is like, how can we uh, apply that method to videos? And there um, is a very simple solution that exists when using instance slots in particular, 
we can simply use the past slots that we discovered in the past time steps initialization for the clustering in the next time step. And, and that's special about these instance slots, which you, it's a benefit you don't get from grid-based representations or from sequence-based representations. And the same holds for supervised methods. Um, you cannot easily kind of extend that to tracking in video. Whereas here, there exists a very simple solution. And uh, what that looks like in our picture is um, something we've done in SAVI, uh, slot intention for video, but it's also been done in, in very related methods, RNNEM and OP3, for example. And you, you simply have like a time self-connection over time in the slots, um, but everything else is per frame independently, like the per, you know, per frame encoder, per frame decoder. Um, but there's just a small connection over time, which is again a very kind of, because that, that latent representation is very small, um, this is very cheap to do. And as an effect, you get like uh, tracking of objects for free, um, like in these robotic examples here. Now the same trick applies for 3D. Um, and again, here instance slots are very beneficial um, because <clears throat> you they're decoupled from the grid. They're decoupled from the input grid. And, and that means no matter from which perspective you observe a scene, those slots will stay uh, in place. And uh, so you can ground them in, in various different observations of the scene. And uh, this is, for example, done in this paper, Unsupervised Discovery of Object Radiance Field, so UORF. Um, from iClay last year, where um, instance slots are basically combined with a novel few synthesis objective. And uh, they're basically trained in a way that you start from an input image, you encode it, you apply some version of slot attention uh, to obtain your object latents, in this case, it's a background latent. And then you have uh, a per token or per slot uh, nerve that renders the novel fuse. You apply an L2 loss in pixel space and train the whole model end to end. And what you get out of it is like per uh, slot kind of binding of objects. And uh, you can then manipulate those scenes. You can render novel views. And uh, these objects are really decoupled from the pixel grid, which is nice. And there's some, some more recent work which, which scales this to more complex data set, for example, like OSRT. So, so far we've covered uh, relatively kind of simplistic scenes, um, like basically a simple, um, like synthetic scenes, like clever and simple kind of 3D scenes that might have some texture, but overall are relatively simplistic in their appearance. And of course, what we're here for um, is like, how do these methods actually perform in the real world? And, and like, how can we make them work uh, and do something reasonable when, when applied to real data? And the answer is basically, if you apply this to data, like uh, these images from MS Coco here, um, is that if you just take these naive recipes I've shown earlier with just auto encoding with like very simple architectures, you get something like this. Um, and this is of course a big disappointment if you are following this literature. And this is, this is the reality is that this has been like the status of the field for um, of these end-to-end -end models with object priors for about uh, five years uh, until uh, more recently, uh, multiple independent papers have been able to overcome these issues. And so what you get here very often is uh, the model just collapses into some uninteresting failure mode. So um, these slots, they just bind to some grid location. They effectively just cluster the positional code and, and fully ignore the visual input. And um, they still represent whatever happens within, within each patch or within each, um, with each, within each of the kind of segments, but they effectively discover a patch-based representation. It's a representation they would like to learn for reconstruction. And um, the problem is that on, on these kind of highly textured and diverse images, slot attention, also many uh, most earlier related methods, they, they typically collapse if you just apply them and, and uh, run the kind of pixel-based reconstruction. And so now the question is like, how can we, uh, how can we overcome it, and what is actually the underlying problem? And uh, so what what people have found over the years is that um, models are typically just uh, like those that were published in initial papers because they were trained on these kind of simple toy data sets. They were just too small and not expressive enough. So often just a few layers of a CNN. And, and of course, uh, as we know, like um, those will, will not do very well on more complex structured data. And so only by, by just using better backbones uh, and using things like data augmentation, these methods can already do a lot better and, and get quite a bit further. 
Um, another problem is that objectness can be ambiguous. Like, like we, we talked a bit earlier about, uh, Patrick especially talked about what is an object and uh, there are so many definitions and uh, so many different use cases. Often we just care about like the salient big physical things in an image, but, but often like objects can also be like uh, more like abstract concepts or just generally like a thing that can be bound to like some kind of a group together to some kind of high level representation. And so um, that also comes with the question of like abstraction level. And because of all this ambiguity, um, like this task is often not very well defined and, and um, needs potentially some additional kind of side information to really be, uh, to be resolved. And optimization of these models often can also be quite brittle. And so you get things like collapse of these models. So in terms of solutions, um, we're going to hear in, in Wadi's talk uh, in just a few minutes um, that training with multimodal signals can actually help a lot. If you don't just look at images purely, but if you look at some other data that you have, you can, you can overcome uh, a lot of these issues. Um, but it can also disambiguate, um, especially if like the problem is really ambiguity of objectness. You can disambiguate things like with partial or weak supervision. Like you don't have to uh, do everything unsupervised because often they are just we just have labels for certain things and you can kickstart a model like that. And uh, things also like as I mentioned before, architectural improvements, pre-training, and data augmentation. These are these are obvious things, um, and and they they definitely work and they definitely help. And so um, I'd like to focus on one particular paper that uh, was presented at iClear just a, a few months ago um, called Dinosaur. And um, as we've already heard in, in the past presentation, like Dino features are, are great uh, for, um, for kickstarting kind of object discovery. And the same applies if you, if you like look at these end-to-end -end models, like uh, using, doing something like solid attention um, with object priors. And you can basically start from pre-trained Dino features, apply solid attention on those. And instead of reconstructing the pixel, you reconstruct the Dino features and, and that can already overcome a lot of these issues. Like uh, here's a lot of attention, has quite a bit of issues and Slate is a method that um, maybe has a little bit of object specificity, but still has a lot of issues. And that is basically a slightly scaled up version of slot attention with a stronger decoder and, and some um, autoencoding pre-training. But Dinosaur really um, like represents a big jump just by, by using good pre-trained features. And on top of that, Dino explores two different decoder designs. Um, and um, instead of using a CNN decoder, um, they um, like play around with like a per pixel or per patch decoder that um, decodes every slot uh, into each patch individually. And then uh, again, uh, together with an alpha channel, uh, weighs, performs a weighted sum and reconstructs the entire image that way. Um, or a transformer decoder that auto-regressively decodes the, the patches of the Dino features. And so both of these perform really well. And ultimately, as if you remember those results from like the last presentation, like token cut, which was doing uh, quite well under this core log metric on Coco with Dinosaur, you can, you can still get quite a bit of a big jump. And that was kind of the first time that, that these kind of end-to-end -end, uh, object-centric methods really uh, made, made somewhat of a dent in, in this part of the literature, which was previously mostly dominated by um, pseudo-labeling strategies and, and kind of multi-stage approaches. Um, there is, there's also more work now. There's, there's quite an explosion also in submissions at IKEA this year. Um, and there's one paper, I think, that, that stood out to me uh, in particular that uh, I have to say this is a paper that is still under review. It's something I found in the archive. Um, but effectively, what they do is they apply solid attention on again, VQVE or Dino features. And now they use a diffusion model as a decoder. And uh, that can really overcome some of the uh, um, also like generation problems the earlier models had. Often they produce blurry uh, generations if you use them also as a generative model. But now if you use a diffusion model as a decoder, you can really get really crisp uh, generations of the scenes while getting the, the, the nice object decomposition. So you not only have like a, a segmentation model now, but also like a compositional generative model as a side effect. And you can train the same thing now on MS Coco and it gets a uh, somewhat decent result for a model of this class. Of course, this is still uh, quite a big gap to, to supervised approaches, but uh, there's been a lot of progress now and uh, all of a sudden in the last year. Um, 
now we mostly focus on, on generation type approaches or reconstruction based approaches. Um, this is not like the entire story. There are also methods that are reconstruction free um, that are trained also kind of end to end that, that don't even start with a pre-trained kind of dino backbone and that also perform uh, quite well on, on these kinds of problems. And one example here is Odin uh, or object discovery and representation networks. Um, and effectively what they learn is they learn an object discovery network that takes a common backbone applied to an image um, and then just applies k-means clustering, like really discrete hard k-means clustering on these tokens to get uh, clusters out of them. And then they perform like a contrastive loss that they call the Odin loss that is very similar to BYOL um, in terms of the objective and the training mechanism. And they learn per uh, object uh, representations in this step. And so basically it's like a, um, a method that iterates between um, discovery and representation and over time, both of these improve. And, and so without doing any reconstruction in pixel space or, or latent hash space, you get uh, somewhat decent uh, localization. Of course, there's, again, there's a big gap um, to supervise models that's still to be, to be solved. Now, because we've mostly talked about segmentation so far, I just want to briefly highlight that uh, these end-to-end -end models, they also uh, enable other things beyond segmentations. Um, and so these discovered object slots, um, because the discovery is, doesn't necessarily have to be done with, with just decoding, you can also co-train that with some downstream objectives. Um, they can really enable data efficient learning for certain tasks, like for example, for simulation, as you can see here in this, uh, in this physical, still again, a bit of a toy example, um, from the slot former paper, where um, you get really a lot of data efficiency benefits. And similarly, in a recent paper called Palm E um, that looked at large scale vision language models for robotic control and planning. And they also explored uh, pre training the visual representation with an uh, object centric slot based model and using that as a representation for the vision language model, which gave them a lot of data efficiency on these kinds of tabletop robotics tasks. And uh, also for things like visual reasoning, like in this Aloe paper from Ding and others at NURBS already some time ago. So um, there are still quite a few open challenges. Um, and although like um, the field has made, I think, uh, a big jump in the last one and a half years or so, um, and these open challenges are still, I hope, I, I think there, there's many of these aspects that can be overcome and that will probably receive a lot of attention in the coming months and years. Um, but I just want to highlight a few here that uh, stand out in particular, especially one question that often comes up in these kind of unsupervised methods is um, how can you bias methods towards semantic versus instance decomposition? Because it's not a priori clear what we care about. If you, if you cluster visual representations, one, one way of clustering it could be according to the high level concepts, like you have one cluster for all people, one cluster for the snow, one cluster for the trees, or you could have one cluster for each individual person or, or roughly the, the spatial regions where the person's are. In. And uh, depending on architectural choices, you end up with different, uh, different regimes in these kinds of models. And, and learning to steer that towards what we care about, maybe even just with a bit of supervision is also an open question. Of course, bridging the gap to supervised methods, um, things like high fidelity generation um, and controllable generation for scene editing, that's something um, that slowly starts to become uh, like feasible, I think, uh, with these methods that you basically get uh, controllable generation by a different mechanism than language, which is what we currently use for those methods. You can then also kind of identify particular object slots and manipulate these directly. Like you could remove it, um, that's the simplest one, but you could also manipulate the content of it. Like you could maybe control the location or 3D rotation of an object. Um, if you, if you really try to scale these methods. And also things like controllable abstraction via textual semantics, like you might wanna um, via text control the level of abstraction if you care about the door of a car or the entire car or the window and so forth. And so some other open questions are really kind of how much do we want to rely on inductive bias versus labeling at scale? And um, I think that is especially relevant now because we've seen labeling at scale actually works remarkably well of course, the problem is far from solved, um, but there are there's been remarkable progress just by by scaling up labeling efforts um, with, with various smart strategies, like in the segment anything model. 
And also questions like, do we need interaction data, um, like robotics data to truly solve learning? Like, does a model have to actually interact with the environment? Or can we just learn from images, video, and text alone? And that's important because from cognitive science, like um, things really point in the direction that interaction is really, really important to learn about the structure of the world. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, so we've talked about object slots in terms of instance, sequence, and grid-based slots, um, various different in uh, architectural inductive biases, um, and how they enable kind of a scalable alternative to supervised object learning while being compatible with the way we do supervised learning these days. And also benefits, uh, like I think one, one exciting aspect is that, that these kinds of approaches really benefit from advances, not only in representation learning, but also in generative modeling, because they can integrate with those kinds of methods. Um, but yeah, real world results are still in infancy, and I'm really excited to see what the community will come up with in, in the coming months and years. Uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, and I think we have some, some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, so questions, I think we can, we have time and there is already a question online, but so maybe we can start by that one. Um, so uh, the first question is, can clustering path uh, itself of the slots be related to a diffusion process? Can one learn semantic features by learning to move along such cluster paths? That, that is a, a really interesting question. Thanks, thanks uh, Vadim, for asking that. So um, in fact, um, it is an iterative refinement process and, and a diffusion is also an iterative refinement process. And so, so basically, I think we can, we can learn a lot from these advances and maybe even solve problems like object ambiguity um, and, and kind of multiple possible interpretations from like thinking about this as kind of an iterative optimization or diffusion process. Um, this has not really been explored, but I think this is a really valuable thing to look into. Um, yeah. We have two questions maybe in the room that we can take. Uh, yeah, go for it. Um, hi, Thomas. Um, thank you so much for the very inspiring talk. Uh, I especially appreciate the honesty around, you know, some of the failure modes of object entry models, <laughs> which I have, you know, personally seen when I apply this type of models to real world data. So my question is, um, uh, so my impression is that the, the way we get those nice object decompositions are based on often limiting the model capacities. Uh, for instance, um, in the original slot attention model, we uh, like the paper only apply, you know, kind of one round of cross attention, uh, of course, with iterative GRU updates uh, without any, you know, self attention or even more rounds of cross attention. Uh, and, and, you know, when I, played around with the model, you know, when I added, you know, more layers of, for instance, self-attention, like they do in detection transformer, um, you know, the model kind of starts to break down. Uh, and also, you know, uh, it, it seems that model capacity allocation really matters a lot because the model is based on the assumption that every slot cannot just model the whole thing. Uh, so if you make every slot's model capacity too powerful, then decomposition kind of starts breaking down. Uh, so my question is, yeah. you know, you know, for supervised model, right? For instance, if you have like anything like Dieter or like the latest greatest Dieter, um, they are trying to allocate as much model capacity as possible. You know, stack as many attention layers as possible. But if, if you know, unsupervised learning is based on limited model capacity, does that mean that we are never gonna match fully supervised, uh, fully supervised learning performance? This is a really great question, and I think it really goes down to the uh, like some of the core uh, problems of like some of the early methods. Um, I, I, so maybe just one clarification: slot attention. We actually do multiple cross attention iterations on the input, even in the original paper. But um, I agree with like the the issue around um, capacity. One thing we found recently, however, if you have good self supervised objectives and, and high data set complexity, you benefit a lot from scaling the capacity of the model and. Uh, these failure modes tend to go away. Like in OSRT, we recently applied that to Street View um, in a paper that's not in the archive. And, and basically just take as big as slots as possible. Like we make them like, I don't know, 4K dimensional or 2K dimensional if I remember correctly. And um, like those failure modes don't happen um, with, with scaling these models. So it, I think it, it really depends on whether there are easy failure modes based on the dataset complexity and also the, um, 
like the, the kind of downstream task you use. If you, if you just use auto encoding, there's tons of failure modes. But if you use like some kind of interesting pretext task, like non-few synthesis or denoising or something like that, a lot of these issues go away. And so I think uh, in the community, we can still, I, I think there's hope that, that we can scale these methods and uh, not, are not limited by, um, by compression as a kind of uh, way to drive decomposition. Um, Thank you. Oh, so, so there are three more questions in the room. So maybe we can make them quick, like to the point, so we can go to where you talk afterwards. Sure. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I know you touched on this briefly at the end, but I was wondering if you could just expand. So now we've got these recent, very large supervised models like Segment Anything, where really there's there's a diverse range of supervision for different types of objectness, different types of object prompt. Um, to what extent? Uh, what what are the failure modes of such models where these kind of techniques still can solve and fill in the gaps? So now that we've got open source models like Segment Anything, which you can apply for a downstream task, when do you still need uh, these kind of inductive biases and self-supervised objectives? That's a great question. So in terms of inductive biases, I would say the, uh, the, the gap is very, very small between something like Segment Anything and, and the kinds of architectures we're looking here. Um, so ultimately, you could also um, swap in something like solid attention maybe multiple heads into into segment anything and you probably wouldn't lose much um that being said um the question is really when do we want self-supervision when do we when are we fine with whatever the annotators decided is, is useful for objectness uh, at this scale and and uh i don't know if you played around with segment anything but there are many many cases where it doesn't give you like the, the object you, you you kind of really care about and want uh, and so kind of linking it to language is an important open aspect. And for that, collecting data will even be more, more difficult, I think. And um, if you can find a way of doing the self-supervised, that would be uh, clearly the most scalable alternative. Um, of course, uh, it remains to be seen whether, like, which of these two approaches, or maybe a combination of both will ultimately play out. Thanks. Thanks. So we have two more. And sorry for the online question. I invite you to master answer afterwards. Yeah, maybe. Online. <laughs> Hello, and thanks for the great talk. So my question relates to disentanglement of these slot latents. So essentially what I'm working on is editing 3D scenes with slot latents. And what I found is that mostly that these slot latents are specific to a scene. So they essentially encode the position, also the lighting and everything. So we right now cannot use them as 3D assets and just replace one slot latent from one scene into another scene. Uh, so what would be uh, your ideas uh, going forward to like make this possible? That is that is a really great question. And I think the answer is really scale. Um, I think if you have diverse enough uh, scenes and and um, examples, I think you will like the model will learn some ab abstract representations and might generalize beyond scenes. Uh, with respect to position, I mean that will be relatively scene specific, but you might be able to learn control of position by, map, by learning a supervised, read out to a particular position and then get control via that, or even kind of find the positions in latent space that define position and, and control it by that. Um, but lighting is an, is, an, is an interesting question. I'm not sure how that can be solved with, without using additional assumptions. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Hi, thanks Thomas for a great talk. Uh, you mentioned a modal completion briefly during your talk. So I wanted to ask like how that relates to understanding object similarity. Basically, because if you want to do object completion, you have to have some understanding of what the object looks like in completion and match different instances of the same object. So how would that fit in in this kind of an unsupervised setting? That's a great question. And I think just by uh, allowing a model like this to see like a huge diversity of objects, it will, uh, if it sees a part of object, it'll make an educated guess of like um, what it could be completed with. Um, and, and that doesn't, re that, it relates to object similarity, but it really relates to kind of learning an abstract representation of, of objects that encodes all possible appearances. And, and um, you don't, you never need to explicitly materialize kind of a similarity between objects or something like that. If that makes okay. sense. Thank thanks you. for the question. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone. Um, okay, so for the questions remaining, Thomas will reply to you, and now we will move on to Wadi's presentation. Um, so uh, Wadi, she is an associate professor at Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong University and a PI at Shanghai AI Laboratory. 
He remains a visitor researcher with Visual Geometry Group VGG at Oxford, where he did his uh, D Phil. I was wondering if that was a PhD. Uh, I don't do you feel okay? Yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> and and uh, worked as a senior researcher um, fellow afterwards at uh, BGG. Uh, he's been supervised during his PhD by Professor Andrew Zissman and Professor Alison Noble. So, Wade, you can put your slide in full screen, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so, first, the, the time. I'm in a time zone which is quite late, so maybe. Um, I'll make some mistake during the talk. I'll try to minimize the mistakes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the self-supervised object discovery by using uh, multimodal signals. And so first, this is quite a huge topic uh, with you know a, a vast major uh, history. So I'll, I'll try to cover um, as many works as I can, but it doesn't mean I can cover all of them. So. Um, if, if you think some of your work I missed, just email me. I'll add them into the slides. Okay. And to start with, I'm going to talk about a little bit about in, uh, perception grouping, because in the literature of computer vision, usually segmentation is very related to perceptual grouping. And actually, um, you know, in 1923, there's something called Gestalt principle that was uh, in psychology and, uh, uh, you know, the scientists specifically want to understand how we human perceive the incoming signals into groups. And you can see, I put some examples here and actually we, we group them differently. And actually the grouping should be based on, you know, different metric. So that's why I say uh, discovering objects usually becomes a question of defining certain similarity metric and in some appropriate space. And I think, that just correlates with multi-signals because each of the type of the signal, they do have some uh, uh, unique property. And I'm gonna talk about that in the following. So the world we live is naturally multimodal. I think I don't need to mention too much about that. Uh, this is a typical video. We have the RGB frames and the RGB frames are temporally coherent. And we have optical flow because things are moving. And you can see the background are relatively uniform. That's really because you know, the cameraman is shooting the uh, the scene and it's static. So the objects are moving independent with the background. So that's why the foreground you can see is jumped out, but the background is uniform. And that's very good, good prior for segmentation. I'll talk about that later. And then the third thing is we know we have sound because when objects moves, typically they will make sound, right? And the last one is, you know, in the recent literature, it becomes very popular because um, ChatGPT, these kind of visual language model like Clip, they become successful. So we know for videos, normally, um, well, not normally, but sometimes we do have narrations, right? And I'm going to talk about how to use these signals uh, to dis discover the objects. Okay, so the agenda, the first thing is, uh, you know, talk a little bit about what self supervised learning is and why this is important. Then talk about discover objects by using motion, uh, by using language, but, and by using audios. Okay. So the first thing is, uh, what is self-supervised learning? So we all know the uh, successful story about ImageNet, and you just train the model. So now it seems like, to some extent, any vision task can be solved by you know, collecting a large data set, and you just uh, define a network architecture, then you just uh, label them, uh, label the data, and train your model then good and sufficient data is all you need. That seems the successful story. And self-supervised learning is actually an alternative uh, for learning representation. And it has very, a lot of good things because the first thing is it saves cost and it's more scalable because we know these vision language models recently, uh, they have to be uh, pre-trained or with self-supervised learning because you need a huge amount of data. You can't label them all, right? And the second good thing is you know, human, we, we do learn from data itself. We, we definitely need some supervision from our parents, but not that much. Mostly we learn with, uh, from self-supervised learning, right? So mainly we learn from observation, manipulation, and we learn from multimodal signals. And that's why uh, self-supervised learning is important. Okay? And what, what is self-supervised learning? I think this becomes very um, standard uh, in this age because 
uh, back to two years or three years ago, I have to explain to everybody what is self-supervised learning. But now I think people know um, better. It's really just a form of unsupervised learning and the data itself can provide the supervision. And the idea is like on, on, the, on the right, bottom right figure, that from Yen and Kong, the idea is really just, you know, you have a, a full signal, you hold some of the part of the signal and you use the rest part to predict uh, whatever you, you, you hold it. It's really like BERT or MAE, uh, these kind of thing are typical uh, self-supervised learning, okay? And in self-supervised learning, the task we are optimizing usually is called proxy task. So when you solve the proxy task, the network is forced to learn something we really care. And in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about one of the proxy tasks, which is reconstruction. We solve that task, the model actually learns to discover the objects. Okay. And the part one, discovering objects by exploring motions. So um, why use motions? Because you know, motion is very powerful cue for discovering the objects. And in the literature, actually, um, you know, some of the scientists really define the objects by motion, like Gibson, he really defines, you know, what, what is an object? Uh, it's detachability, it's the possibility of moving a body in, independently. That's called uh, objects, right? And for these tasks, what we really care is just, you know, these are the videos, and you really just want to segment the salient objects from the video, because salient objects, uh, mostly in the video, it's just something moves. If nothing moves, you know, you, you don't pay much attention to anywhere in the video, but anything moves, you immediately pick it out. I'll give you an example here. So this is a camouflage video. If things doesn't move, you know, it's very hard to, to focus on anything. But if, you know, the insect moves immediately, you focus on it. Okay. So that's why motion is, is a powerful cue for discovering objects. And to use the motion uh, to discover the objects, uh, there are actually many different uh, methods. And I, you know, I, I classify them into two branches. The first one is reconstruction based. And in the reconstruction based, you can reconstruction the flow or the depths or even the RGB. And the other one is same to real, meaning you can train on simulation data and the model can transfer to the real videos. So these are the uh, typical uh, methods. I'm going to talk, uh, pick some of them and give a bit details. Okay. So the first one is um, reconstruction, the, uh, reconstructing the flows. And the first approach I want to talk about is this called contextual information separation, because it's, it's very unique to, to, from my perspective, because in, when I started this field, I feel this method is so interesting. And the idea is you train an adversarial contextual model. So it, it's trying to reconstruct the, the flow, but it's not to say you have to reconstruct the flow as, as good as possible. It's the opposite, meaning you have to reconstruct the flow as worse as possible. So the fundamental assumption is, you know, in the optical flow space, the foreground and the background are independent. Are independent. That means, so if you have a network, say on the left, you have a segmenter. If the segmenter takes the RGB image and the flow as input, it will give you a binary mask. So if this binary mask is perfectly segmented the objects, then for the second in painter, it can't in paint the flow back because the background and the foreground, they are mutually independent. If you mask one out uh, perfectly, the other can't give you any information to be painted back and vice versa. So that's the idea. So that's why I say it's, it's trying to solve a minimax problem and, um, yeah, so you just optimize this loss until uh, the segmenter get the perfect uh, uh, dog and your impainter can never impaint it back. So that's the idea. That's the first approach. And the second approach is also based on flow reconstruction. That's Thomas has just mentioned. Uh, it's really just slot attention used in the optical flow space because in the RGB space, the natural videos tend to be very complicated. If you just use the slot attention, uh, mostly you can't reconstruct very well, but in the flow space, everything becomes very uniform. So you can uh, reconstruct them pretty well. And while you reconstruct them, the alpha channel, which is, you know, you do linear composition uh, between the reconstruction layers, that becomes the uh, mask, the foreground mask. 
And this is the a little bit detailed, but Thomas has explained, so it becomes easier for me. Uh, you just pass the optical flow into an encoder and you do iterative binding, which is actually the slot attention. So you have two learnable uh, queries. Um, well, slot attention used Gaussian initialized, but here it's learnable queries and you just do um, you know, slot attention and then you decode to reconstruct the flow. And actually, if you, you can reconstruct the flow because the foreground and the background, they are independently moving. So actually for the network, they are trying to learn a trivial solution because to reconstruct the flow in the easy way, the model tends to learn one slot represent the foreground and one slot represent the background because as I said, they are independent. And this is the second idea, uh, how, to do, um, how to use flow reconstruction to, to learn to discover the objects. And the third idea is, um, it's Europe's paper 2021. So the idea is to reconstruct the RGB, but actually to me, it's still about reconstructing the flow. And that's why I say this is because uh, they are training two branch. So here, uh, two frames, I and J as input to the motion pathway. So the motion pathway output a flow. Um, and what they do is they sort of like quantize the flow because they use the mean of a region, the flow to represent the whole shape. And they use that to warp the RGB frame and to reconstruct the RGB frame. So you can see uh, ideally their, their, their flow used to warp uh, the RGB frames becomes very uniform again, right? And actually these, uh, the appearance pathway, they learn the segmentation model that becomes, you know, uh, just cover the foreground because that's an easy way for the model to, uh, because every pixel on the foreground, they move the same uh, direction and same speed. So you just use one uh, displacement ve vector can represent the whole objects moving. That's the idea, right? And uh, so these three methods are just uh, reconstruction based. So next thing is how can you train with uh, synthetic data. And one of the typical uh, example is this all clear is uh, published uh, in Europe last year. So the core idea is if you can't simulate video in the RGB sequence, um, you can simulate it in the flow space because flow is very simple to simulate. It's uniform, right? And the idea is you simulate the video uh, in this way. You just put the objects onto the background so you can see it's not realistic at all. But if you compute the flow with some uh, off-the-shelf uh, flow estimator, let's say you use a raft, um, you know this looks fairly realistic. You just train on these uh, flow input. The model just generalized to real videos. Okay. So because you simulate the whole video, so you have all the information. You have the model mask and you have the a model mask. A model mask meaning you know the objects before occlusion, right? And you can simulate as many as possible and you just train the model with this. So th this architecture is not very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty standard. It's like mask former. Uh, so you have optical flows uh, passed to the CNN encoder and you have some transformer encoder to do temporal aggregation. Then you have K learnable queries. So it's still object centric representation, but it's really like mask former. And then you just decode uh, the mask for each object. And also you decode a layer ordering because you have the A model information. So you really can train this uh, whole architecture with A model. The reason we have to train this with A model is really because uh, using motion uh, to discover objects has one bad or one disadvantage because if things stop moving, you miss it. And you have to train the model such that the model can, can remember the objects. This is called object permanence, by the way. So that's why we train the model, even the model is occluded. Okay. And so for these methods I just talked about, there are benchmarks, people measure the progress. And the benchmarks are SecTrack, FBMS, Davis 2016, and Mocha. And also nowadays people also use Davis 2017 because uh, these four data set, I put it here, they are mostly um, just single objects. And now people use multi-objects, which is uh, Davis 2017, and also YouTube US, but I haven't put it here. Yeah, sorry. And metric-wise, people use uh, mean IOU and also use some uh, um, detection rate because for Mocha, it's very hard 
to annotate their uh, very accurate mask. I'll show you why. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the Mocha data set. And let me click, click this. So this is the Mocha data set. And this, this is specifically collected with camouflage animals. And that's why, you know, only in the, in the motion space, it's very easy to discover the objects. Well, it's not easy, it becomes possible. But in the RGB space, it becomes very hard. So that's the, this data set to test how well the motion segmentation has been progressing. And this is some of the result. I didn't put all of the result uh, because it's going to be too long. I put some just to show you the progress on this community. And as you can see, this is the uh, results on Davis 2016. So you can see on the uh, real data supervised learning method, they achieve like 85.6 uh, each. And actually, without using any manual annotation, the method now getting over 80. So it's very close to the real data segmentation. To, to the real data supervision ones. Okay. And this is on Davis 2017. So 2017 has multiple objects. And again, um, the unsupervised, just you know, without using any manual annotation, uh, the, the performance is over 64, uh, which is pretty remarkable, I would say. And the performances keep going uh, nowadays. But still, we have to admit that uh, it's still uh, a little bit behind the supervised models. And these are the results. So this is the Davis 16. So it's single objects. So you can see um, for the, this is the Mocha data set. You can see in the RGB space, it's very hard to segment the objects. But if you look at the flow space, um, you know, it becomes easier. And this is multiple objects. So this is Davis 17. Uh, for the pig one, you can see even there is severe occlusion, the model can still segment them or track them. Note that all the models have been trained, you know, completely without any human supervision or human annotations. And this is more result on camouflaged. So um, even the objects in the RGB space becomes very hard to, to see. Uh, the model still works in the flow space. Cool. Uh, that's every. Uh, that's the um, ideas I want to discuss uh, for flow-based motion dis uh, object discovery, and these are the references. So, uh, if you are interested in this community, uh, make sure you check these these papers. And the second thing I want to talk about is how to use language uh, to do the object discovery. And the idea is, well, the objective is so given an image. Uh, the task is you want to segment the objects and also classify its uh, category. Let's say the first one uh, on the left, you want to know this is a train and which pixel belongs to a train, which pixel belongs to the railway uh, and the, the trees or the forest, right? And we want to train models on a large number of paired image caption samples. Uh, we don't want to use any manual annotations, okay? That's the idea. Oh, that's the objective. And typically, there are two lines of research in the literature. So the first line is, can we better exploit the vision language correspondence in pre-trained clip? And there are several methods, like mask clip, record, OVSAC, and et cetera. Because um, in the 2021, 2022, there are many methods uh, trying this direction. And the second way, or the second research direction is, can we train a model end-to-end? -end? just using image text pairs via grouping and contrast learning. Because as the previous uh, presenter has already mentioned, Transformer has very good property on grouping things. So if that's the case, can we just use Transformer to train the model uh, with image text pairs? And there are several methods. Uh, last year, the first method called GroupVit is also published CDPR. And this year, it's OV uh, Segmenter also doing similar thing, but much more efficient. So just to make sure we are on the same page, uh, this is the clip model. They are trained with vision language doing contrast learning. And the good thing is uh, during inference or during training, actually the classifier can be generated from the text embedding. So you can imagine the 
the structure in the language has been inherited in the text encoder. So the text encoder has already encoded a lot of fine-grained and shared attributes be between different semantic classes. So that's why it can do zero-shot generalization later. And I think the first this gives a way, a scalable way, to train the foundation models to the community. Okay. And the first paper I, I'm going to talk is how to use this clip to do object discovery. So it's called mask clip. And the idea is very simple, actually. So the idea is you have a clip. The clip can do uh, image-wise classification, right? Just we convert it to do pixel-wise classification. So that's the idea. And you can see uh, as an in input of the image, and also you input the uh, category name to the clip text encoder, and you get the classifier for different categories. So you just do pixel-wise classification. But of course, you have to make some changes to the image encoder because uh, previously, if you don't do that, you're going to map the whole image into a single vector. But now you do some uh, changes, like you remove some of the um, global attention or something like that, and it becomes a relatively dense uh, feature map, uh, although the resolution is smaller, but still it's relatively dense, right? And you just use text embedding dot product with this uh, dense feature map. You get a, a dense, um, well, label map, I would say. And you can use the, this label map as pseudo labels distilled to another model. So they train a separate segmenter termed a mask clip plus with a pseudo mask. And the model just becomes pretty powerful. So as you can see, uh, the model can segment different person, uh, Batman and Joker, and Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. So it, it can distinguish instances now. So this is about inheriting what the, the clip has. Okay. And the second one, also doing uh, trying the same idea, but trying to use what, whatever in the clip. But what they do is they try to do retrieval first. Uh, so something like this. So if you want to segment one object, you go to the corpus, maybe this is image or something. You do, do a retrieval. So you retrieve a lot of images with the same objects. Then you do co-segmentation. Once you do co-segmentation, you know these, these images all contain these objects. So you can you know, distill another uh, segmenter. And well, similar as the previous work, you just use the co-segmented mask as pseudo mask and you train another model by distillation. And again, it, the model just works to uh, many, many different categories. Okay. And so the, the, the previous two works were using the uh, clip. So now we move to the next uh, uh, branch. Can we train the model end to end? And this is the first paper, I think, called Group Bit. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first paper doing this. And what they do is, um, again, as previous um, presenter has mentioned, they just exploit what the good property about uh, transformer. So the transformer can group things together. So what they do is they do uh, the visual entity groups just emerge without any mask annotation in the transformer. And they assign a label to each segment according to the similarity to the text embedding. And here is the detailed uh, procedure. So one image to the model, you just break it down to patches, right? And you do linear projection. So you, here you have some learnable group tokens and you pass to the transformer. And the group grouping block is really just uh, uh, cross attention. So each pixel will be assigned to one of the learnable tokens. And then at this stage, because it's very early, so you can see the group tokens, they are very uh, separated. They uh, claim you know, different regions, small regions. But what they do is they can uh, group the tokens, then hierarchically, uh, after grouping the tokens, the tokens claim larger and larger uh, regions. Okay? And for training, you just have a, because you use image and text pairs, so you have the caption, so you just do contrast learning, you just train in this way. And this is the really detailed contrast training, so you have the positive, which is the paired image and the caption. And you randomly sample some other uh, captions. Okay. Oh, this is random sample. They, they don't show it, but they, they show the other two. It's also uh, positive because they can extract the entity from the paired caption and do a template, do a prompt template. They are also positive. So you can see it becomes 
three diagonal matrices. And they just train with uh, a sum of the contrast loss. And after training, they show that uh, in the transformer, uh, the group token, they discover something with similar semantics. So you can see this one discovered the eyes. Uh, this one discovered the legs. Uh, this one discovers the, yeah, the grass or, or something green, I would say, yeah. And this one discover, I think, the face. So you can see here. Oh, body, sorry. Anyway, so the group tokens, they discover a certain shared sem uh, semantics. And also face, yeah. And at inference time, what you're going to do is you're going to pass the image to the transformer to, or the group bit. So you get, uh, and also the data set classes to the text encoder. And then you do the dot product because for the group bit, you really output several tokens. So each token will claim a region, as I just explained. And they will dot product with the text encoder. Uh, you know, you actually classify each of the uh, groups. And that's the idea. And it works pretty well, I would say. But one of the, you know, the disadvantages I will show you in the table later, it's very inefficient. It needs a lot of data to train the model. And so this year, CVPR, um, we propose, uh, you know, to improve this training a little bit by doing uh, two regularization. So the first one is mask token completion. What we do is, it's similar to the group bit, but the learnable token we just feed in another model another language model, so just to fill in the mask. So we first filter the entity in the caption, say, what are the nouns um, in the caption? And we mask them out and ask the model to fill in them. So you can imagine this task will uh, force the model to learn better alignment between the visual and the text, okay? And also we do cross image mask consistency. That means uh, use the caption. We can run. We can easily just source images with the same uh, with a shared uh, semantic entity. Say, uh, for the first image, you have cat. You can you can search another image with cat. Just use the caption because that's easy. And then use these. You know, uh, both image contain the cat. So you you have the group token. Uh, you found the group token to dis discover the cat. So you can do a you know a image change exchange. So they should be consistent. So that's the idea. And to benchmark the progress, uh, people use Pascal VOC, Pascal contacts, and Cocoa objects, and evaluate on MILU on all the classes. So this is the table, and you can see um, this is the group VIT results. So they train on CC 12 million. That's quite a lot of images. And we can train on CC 4 million, but still uh, much better performance than them. This gray one, uh, highlighted is from Apple, and they train on 133, uh, 34 million. That's quite a lot of images. Uh, I think it's I clear submission. I'm not sure if it, it's accepted or not, but that that's a lot of images. I would say. And they do show some good results, honestly. Okay, so these are the reference for visual language, uh, using visual language information to discover the objects. So the last thing is, we can also discover the objects by using some audiovisual correspondence. And this is actually has been researched quite a long time, I'd say. And there are several groups in the, um, in the community like MIT or Berkeley. The people, a lot of researchers are doing this sort of uh, using audio to discover the objects. So due to the time, I'm gonna just mention uh, two or three. So the idea is, or the objective is, uh, given the video on the left and also the audio, uh, it's corresponding audio, can you discover the objects? So I'm going to play this one. Sorry, Wadey, I don't know online, but uh, here we don't hear the sound. Okay, so it's, the, it's nothing, um, it's similar. It, it, well, it's nothing special. It's just the vacuum uh, cleaner sound. <laughs> and the model just tried to dis discover the objects. Okay. And the core idea is uh, people do is you just train with contrast learning. It's really like how you train clip. And like I explained earlier, when you train clip with 
vision and language to global contrast learning, the model just learns to do the dense segmentation. And for this one, it's similar. You just do uh, image and audio. You do contrast learning to global wise. And actually, this paper do, does a little bit more. And what they do is they do a softer thresholding and found the foreground objects. So those are the positive. And you, you found the background. Those are the negative. In the middle, you define a tri map because those are uncertain regions. You don't put any penalty on them. So you, you ask the model to tune a little bit, say, find the best boundary. That's the idea. Okay. But essentially, it's still contrast learning. And with this, what you can do is, so this is a, uh, just, just with this idea, you, it, I think this paper is 2021. Yeah, it's very old. And with this, you can discover the objects. So now I'll show you how, after you discover this object, what can you do with that? And this is the paper uh, from last year's VPR is something like this. So, so the first step is, as I explained earlier, so you can discover the object now using the audio. And what you can do is you can find these boxes, crop them out, and you do self-labeling. Self-labeling is really just clustering. So you can cluster in these boxes into different categories. And with this pseudo label, you can train a detector. And that's why that's where it can be used in you know real videos or real images. Okay. And actually it works. And the good thing is it works for more general categories. It's not work only working for the instrument because people may um, just may assume because you train on these objects, because you know, if the object doesn't make any sound, you can't discover it at the first step, at the first step place. Uh, but actually the object proposal is class agnostic. It can generalize to more general categories. So uh, these images quality results shows that uh, even for some of the objects, they don't make too much sound, but still uh, you can detect them. And if you check the paper, they have quantitative numbers. The numbers are pretty good, I would say. And these are the reference for using the audio to discover the objects. So to summarize, I just to show you we can discover objects by using motions, by using languages, and also by using audios. And this is what we know. And what we don't know is, uh, at least to me, because these data or these uh, problem setting are relatively small. Uh, what happens if we scale up the training? Uh, will that be you know, acting very good representation for other downstream tasks? Um, I, I don't know, seriously. And the second thing is, what granularity can we do? Because usually for these um, self-supervised uh, object discovery, it's discovering the whole object. Uh, can we do more fine grained, like body parts or different facial parts, et cetera? And the, second, uh, the third thing is, we know the generative model, like diffusion models, they are becoming very good. And you know, at, at some point, we think they really understand the images because they can generate uh, you know, the shadows, or they can generate um, uh, geometry or these kind of things. But to what to what extent the segmentation has been built in? Because if we think they really understand the image, they must have the uh, segmentation built in the model, right? And that's it. I think that's for uh, for my talk. Thank you for listening. Any questions? So we already have one question in the room. Go for it. Um, hi, Wendy. Um, thank you for the amazing talk. So my question is about the first part of the talk um, about using flow. Um, so I, I guess when I was, you know, looking at the papers and playing around similar models using flow for object discovery, I find that uh, a lot of this uses some um, synthetic data to pre-train the flow. And often pre-training, you know, is on data sets with only a few objects in one thing. So if you go to, let's say, a real world, a real world scene with potentially 50 or 100 actors, um, there's quite a large domain gap. And often when you have a lot of actors, there's actually a chicken and egg problem because you can only do the flow very accurately if you kind of sort of already know what are the objects. Um, so that, that seems to be an obvious like upper bound bottleneck for this type of flow-based object discovery. Um, and also, you know, the, the flow training part is not part of the pipeline. Once flow is trained, it's just fixed. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts on that? Well, 
my understanding is, like I said, um, from you know how human learns all these kind of things. Flow really, it's a starting point. You can discover the objects, but once you discover the object in the flow space, possibly you need to go back to the RGB. Because let's say in the flow space they are uniform, and you discover this is the whole object. But in the RGB space, they are very different the pixels because people may wear you know red shirt and uh, blue uh, you know blue shoes, etc. And if you go back to the RGB space and train the model, force the model, say, you have to learn a uniform dis a uniform representation for all the pixels of the human, then actually you're doing something similar to supervised learning. That's exactly what supervised learning people are doing. Just you, you know, you, you, you have the same prior, say, these semantically, they are the same, and you force the model to learn the representation to, to be invariant to that. So I think flow, there, there are several methods uh, or several papers they are trying to do is using flow as a, a way to generate pseudo mask and then go back to the RGB space, distill that into the RGB space. There's a paper called DASDAB. It gets very good results. Does that answer your question? Uh, so my point is often the flow part learning is supervised. You need supervised learning to get the flow and unsupervised flow. Uh, there, there are some unsupervised methods for the flow, but it doesn't do as, as good. So, oh, I see. Uh, so, so, so my point is like, so, so you have part of the pipeline that is supervised, which is the flow part. And uh, if you scale that to the real world thing, right? Unsupervised flow yeah. is, is very tricky to get that to work. I see. But I think uh, self-supervised flow is also a, a progressing uh, community, like um, auto flow or I think Google published uh, several flow papers this year and last year, right? Well, all, all doing uh, self supervised mm -hmm. And on the Sintel, these kind of benchmark, they are doing quite well, I think similar to the Raft already. I see, thank you. Um, so I don't know if there are more questions. I actually had one. Um, during your talk, I was wondering, what is your favorite modality to work with and, and why? I think current, nowadays, I think language possibly is my favorite, but it's 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 very crowded, so it's very very difficult to do it with you know with limited resources. But I would say language is my favorite. I think. Okay, thanks. We have another one in the room. Oh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I just had a quick question about the um, the first techniques using flow. Um, the thing is like. <clears throat> When you are trying to segment objects using the flow, you face the problem is like, uh, because we get articulated motion, we get to seg like over segment the objects. Uh, I'm, I'm working in, a, in this field. And, um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you have any idea like we could do to like avoid this over segmentation. Because as long as we, like, as, long, as long as we segment with motion, we always get articulated motion all the way. And um, so I don't know if you have any like ways we could face it or. Well, it's it's hard to say it's a good thing or bad thing, actually, because like I mentioned uh, in the last slides, which granularity we are talking about. If you talk about the whole human, the whole person, maybe articulate is not great. But if we were talking about want to segment the person into limbs or body, it's a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But the best thing is control. Like, like if you could choose to do it, because most of the techniques, uh, like, uh, for example, probable motion pattern, are using a flow to segment and then are using Dino features to group the, the to group the segments together and that's real the, that's kind of a trick that it's kind of hidden in some way because like we don't like but in I don't know if there is like any signal we could use outside of Dino features or outside of pre-trained features to to group the to group the, the motion together like um, yeah I think I do want something like some different hierarchy of the segments. Yeah. It's really proposals. You can pick, you can maybe use in context learning later on to pick which hierarchy you really are interested yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's very nice. Um, I, I had another question. Um, I was wondering in, in the video with the video modality, so you are able to find object that moves, that move, sorry. Um, and 
I was wondering what about the other ones, um, the objects that do not move, uh, and if if you have thoughts on that. Um, I guess if the camera is moving, maybe there is some idea there. Yeah. Well, if, if the well, first thing is if the object doesn't move along the whole video, uh, relying on motion, we can't do anything. Uh, but if, if so, what we defined the problem before is if the object moves in any of the frame and we want to get it out, get it segmented. And if that's the case, say the object never moves, then maybe depths can give you other information because it, it, as long as it's not panning, uh, you know, you, you, you use the camera just walking around, uh, the depths will, depths map could possibly be used similarly as the flow map. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, thanks. Any more question in, in the room? Online. Um, so, so thanks a lot, uh, Wadi, for your great talk uh, and for the question answering. I guess. Um, so I'll I'll just take the hand for the. Well, it's it's very exciting slide. You'll see. Uh, it's, uh, okay. Oh, I've been signed out. Great. Sign in. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. I've been signed out. Uh, okay, so it was just. No, no, no. Okay. Yes. Uh, don't look at my screen. Uh, okay. So, um, I would like to thank a lot uh, all the presenters of today's uh, today that were here and that unfortunately couldn't come to last minute uh, visa, Canadian visa setup. Um, but um, we've been very happy to have this tutorial. Well, at least I've been I've been very, very happy about it. And I hope that the story that we tried to bring to you uh, was interesting. So um, I guess if you have any general comment question, now is the time we plan 10 minutes for that. Um, or not, and everybody can go to lunch. <laughs> Maybe that's the way to go. Uh, Wadey, Thomas, any last minute comments? Uh, maybe it's worth saying that we we uh, land on having the recording available on the website um, yes. sometime soon after the conference. Um, yeah, and also just thank you for for organizing everything on the spot. Uh, I I had to cancel my trip pretty last minute, um, but thankfully we could still help the tutorial. Yeah. No yeah. Worries. Okay, so let's uh, wait. Wait. Yeah. So your microphone. Yeah. Um, same. I mean, thank you very much for organizing this. Yeah. And my comment. Thank you, Ariane, for the for the fantastic work in putting everything together. Uh, thank you. So thank you, guys, and uh, let's let's eat. Thank you. Uh, bye, guys. Bye, bye. Yeah. Uh, so how do I not mess up that recording? Uh, do I just click here? Stop recording. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay.